Good evening, everyone. Before we get into tonight's stories, I got two quick things to say. First, happy September. You made it through another month. Congratulations. And two, if you're in Florida, please try to stay safe. I know it's really, really rough out there right now, and I'm sending all my well wishes to you all. I will try to find some reputable charities and link them in the description if you want to help with uh, everything that's going on over there. From what I've heard, it's really, really bad. And here in North Carolina, we might see a little bit of it, but I, I think Florida is definitely getting the worst of it. So if you're in Florida, I'm sending my wishes out to you and uh, just try your best to stay safe. Now, let's get into tonight's stories. I don't have long left. They're coming for me, and it's only a matter of time before they find me. I'm sitting here, this abandoned shack I found in the wood, using only the shafts of moonlight that coming through the broken windows to write this. I know that this will be the last chance I get to warn everyone, to tell them to find safety and hide. <laughs> hide? never thought in a thousand years I would ever think to use this word for myself. I can barely write this. My hands are shaking so violently the blood off my fingers is staining the papers I try to write. I'm sorry. I am so sorry that it has come to this. That I have to hide like some kind of animal. They're all dead. My friends. My comrades. Jess was the first to go down. They caught her as we were leaving the old mill back in town. I didn't know how they found out that we were staying there, but they did. We were packing, taking as much as each of us could carry on our backs. We heard them break through the front doors of the mill, their booted steps echoing through the empty building as they ran looking for us. We grabbed what we had and ran for the roof. But Jess forgot something. A locket or some shit. I told her to leave it. We'd come back for it later, but... But she couldn't leave it. Jess had told me once that the locket was a gift from another life. From a time she would never forget. A lover lost to war. I wasn't surprised that she wouldn't leave it, but I still tried to beg her to come with us. That it wasn't worth it. The others tried to tell her as well. But they were the ones who told me to leave her. They're the ones who told me that we needed to run. It had just started to rain as we ran across the roof. We could barely hear those first gunshots over the low rumble of thunder above us. The first screams still echo in my ears. I can hear them as if they were still around me. The screams made my skin crawl, the air filling with the sounds of death, and then... Silence. The four of us were scaling down the ladder when the silence filled our ears. A deafening sound. We all stopped. We shouldn't have stopped, but we did. Luke was on the ground already. He was always the fastest out of the five of us. He was looking up at the roof just as we were. Zack was beneath me on the ladder. Abby was above me, frozen as she waited. I should have known she'd have called to the roof for Jess. She should have never called out for her. We might have gotten away if she hadn't. It was only seconds after Abby had called out that we saw the black figure look over the edge of the roof, and I know my eyes went wide just like the others. That black, menacing figure. I heard so many tales of black dogs being omens or black cats, ravens, and crows. But I'd never felt as afraid as I had right then when I stared up at that faceless black figure that stared back at us. It was Zack that broke the silence finally. He yelled for us to jump and run. We were still halfway up the building on the ladders and looking down I remember seeing Luke shouting up at us. I couldn't hear what he was yelling. Gunshots were too loud around us. I didn't get a chance to jump. 
Zack grabbed my ankle and tugged me hard, forcing them to release the prongs of the ladder. Abby had already jumped off the side of where she'd been, hurling herself down to the ground below. She'd always been the one to make these kind of jumps with such precision and beauty. She'd been a dancer once, a long time ago. She landed almost naturally on the ground below, rolling a few feet before standing up and grabbing at Luke, trying to pull him with her, telling him we'd catch up. I felt the ground before I saw him. My body bounced against the hard cement, and I felt my knees and palms scrape against its rough surface. Zack, though, was there with me, grabbing me up and pulling me up to my feet. Luke was around us, trying to get us to move. It was all happening so fast. I remember briefly looking back at the mill's roof and seeing eight black figures now, all of them shooting toward us, but we were faster than they were anticipating. We weren't Jess. We weren't reckless and rushing in blindly like she had. The next thing I knew, the four of us were running down the alley between the old general store and the florist. Zack brought me here once. It was one of the only places in this small town that sold our favorite brand of drink. It had been back when I'd first met him after I'd wandered into the town. I remember that day like it was yesterday. His dark hair and those violet-colored eyes. He was dashing and polite. But so mysterious. I'd been so thirsty from wandering through the woods that surrounded the town, so hungry. I still don't know how the four of us managed to get away from the mill, but... We knew that it hadn't been without sacrifice. None of us asked about Jess. None of us questioned if she'd catch up or where she could be. It was like all four of us knew the answer without asking it aloud. I knew. There was no way that she'd gotten out of there alive. They'd killed her, just like they'd kill us if they caught us. Luke was the first one to speak as we ran across Main Street, leading us to the old movie theater. He said what we all knew. We had to leave, to run as fast as we could and get out of there. He told us of a sanctuary, a place where we'd all be safe. St. Louis. I'd never been there before, but I knew that was at least an hour and a half away from our little hometown of Herman. Zack asked how we'd possibly make it there, and Luke just told him we'd figure it out. It almost felt as if maybe Luke knew what was to come, but was just too afraid to tell us. Abby was already checking the theater, making sure that we were safe, at least for a few moments. She was the quietest of us all, so she was always the first to volunteer to go scout around if we needed it. When she came back, though, none of us were ready for the look on her face. She had no color on her face, which was saying something due to how light-toned she already was. She told us we couldn't stay here, but of course, when Luke asked her why, she wouldn't answer. He pushed her out of the way and walked into theater number one. I shouldn't have followed. I should have listened to Zack when he told me to stay with Abby. My hand shot to my face immediately after walking into the dark room. I covered my mouth, my nose... The smell of blood was so overwhelming that it made my stomach lurch and turn. At least 15 people. All of them dead. There were bullet casings covering the floors and the bodies were just there. Thrown across chairs and in the aisles. Zack told me later that this was where they lured everyone at first, that this is how we got so many of us down so quickly. I still didn't understand what was going on, though, but I was too afraid to ask. Abby came running into the theater room shortly after, telling us we had to leave right then. We didn't ask questions. We didn't need to. 
Zack ran to the back of the theater, back past the screen, and pushed open the door to the back alley. We ran. We had to. We left our temporary hiding place and ran back out into the rain that was now pouring down from the sky like buckets that were being dumped down on top of us. We had to run for the forest, to where we had constant cover and safety. But that was at least eight blocks away in either direction. We were in almost the center of the town. Luke thought we should head toward where the bus station was, back on the east side of town. It made the most sense because St. Louis was east of here, but Zack thought it might be too obvious. That they'd probably be waiting for us and that the roads most likely had roadblocks by now, but it was Abby who thought much differently. She'd been so quiet this entire time, but finally she said we needed to go back for Jess. Zack just looked at her. Luke bluntly said no. Abby, though, wasn't going to settle for that answer. She started to cry, or maybe that was just rain dripping down her face. She asked what if Jess was still alive or hurt and needed help. The three of us knew we couldn't go back, regardless if she was alive or not, but Abby didn't want to hear it. I begged her to stop getting louder, but soon she was shouting at us, calling us monsters, telling us that this was all our fault. Abby said she was going back by herself, that she was going to get Jess. She kept backing up, and we were trying to get her to stay, to calm down, and to think about this, but just as she stepped back to where the side alley of the theater was, her head jerked to the right, an explosion of blood sprang from the left side of her head. She made a sick, groaning sound as if still trying to talk, then just dropped to the ground. I know that I screamed, even though I shouldn't have, because Zack grabbed my arm and pulled me as him and Luke began to run the opposite way down the alley. East it was. I was in shock. I hadn't even heard the gunshot before she fell to the ground. Abby and Jess were the second people I'd met when I'd come here. They were in the general store buying the same brand of drinks that Zack was buying me. They were beautiful girls, best friends. They'd been friends since before they could remember, and they were nearly inseparable. In fact, over the past numerous years, I can only recall a handful of times when they'd been away from one another. Jess had been in love with Luke, but Luke liked Abby. Unfortunately, Abby never got over her lost love. We ran down that alley as fast as we could. We didn't even look behind us. We'd turned down this alley, then that, swerving in and out of the buildings, doing the best that we could to avoid the main streets. We didn't see another soul until we got to where the bus station was. Herman Station was small, nothing big and glamorous, just a small outdoor station with kiosks where they sold tickets. It was quiet there. Luke had expected to find at least a bus or two, since there were normally a couple that were kept here for backup or emergencies, but they were long gone. Apparently, they'd been evacuating for a day or two before now, quietly. It was like they knew who they did and didn't want to save. We'd have to run from here, make our way to St. Louis by foot. Luke even grabbed a map from a nearby kiosk, just so we knew where we were going and where to avoid. He had made the trip to St. Louis numerous times, but this would be the first time any of us had walked there. We let our guard down, though. We'd finally thought we were free, that we had our way out, and we were going to get out of there. We'd started walking toward the tree line to the woods, and we didn't bother checking behind us. We were stupid. 
Luke heard them first. Those heavy combat grenade boots slamming against the concrete as they ran. He told us to run, told Zack to keep me safe. They had their guns up and firing before I even knew what was going on. I heard the bullets ricocheting from us as Zack pulled me by my hand toward the trees. I didn't dare look back at Luke. I could hear the screams again, just like before at the mill. People were dying. Luke was dying. While we were running, I asked Zack what was going on, why this was happening. I thought we had a government immunity, that we were safe, that we could live. Zack told me that the immunity was over, that the newest president had thrown out the agreements and had deemed us all a threat to the nation. He called us monsters. He said that we had no reason to be here anymore. Zack told me that we were no longer safe. He said that all we could do was get to St. Louis where the safe house had been built just in case anything like this had ever happened. From that point to now, sitting in this shack, it's still a blur. We'd ran for quite a while, then just started walking east. It started to get dark when the sound of helicopters could be heard in the distance. Zack told me, not to worry. Just keep moving. But I had this overwhelming feeling of dread welling up inside me. We were in the middle of nowhere. I had no idea where we were or which way to go. Zack was leading me every step of the way. And I trusted him just as I always had since the day that I'd met him. He was my savior, my protector. He'd recognized me the moment I'd entered Herman. He knew that I was someone who would need to be protected. He took me under his wing and did just that. He introduced me to his friends, took me to the mill, showed me what it was like to trust and have friends again. Even now, when his life was on the line, he knew that if he left me behind, he could save himself. He protected me. He taught me so much over the past numerous years I didn't know what I would ever do without him. I'd relied on him so much that now I didn't want to think about what would happen if we were separated. But we are separated. After hearing those helicopters in the distance, we heard the dogs and then the people. The men were loud as they hunted us through the woods, obviously not trying to hide that they were close. It was like a game of cat and mouse to them. The hunters had become the hunted. When they were starting to surround us, Zack hid me in some brush and told me to find the first opening and make a run for it. I didn't want to. I wanted to stay right there and die with him. I stayed long enough to see the start of the fight. I kicked and punched him and he took every hit even though I knew he could have fought back. He was stalling them. He was saving me. It took every fiber of my being to not call out for him, to scream his name as I watched him taunt him and stab him. I laughed at him, called him names, and dared him to fight back like the others. But he didn't. He just looked toward where he'd hidden me and closed his eyes. I still don't know how I got out of there. Even when... I just know that I ran the moment they shot that first bullet. I ran for what felt like hours. I ran until my chest burned and my body ached. I ran as fast as possibly could, putting as much distance as I could between me and them. Now I'm here. Hiding. I can hear the helicopters now, far off into the distance. I could try to run for it, but... I don't know where I'd go. I'm going to fight. I have to. It's in my nature. <sighs> I've already drank my last bottle of fangs. And I remember that first bottle Zack ever gave to me. The government had created this for us. To sash our hunger. So that we didn't have to feed. So that we could live with everyone else. We worked. 
We loved, we laughed. We did just as everyone else did. We made names for ourselves, became citizens. We didn't train to hunt. We didn't need to fight. We grew weak and... Civilized. We weren't monsters. We weren't vampires. We were... Us. But that's gone now. Abby, Jess, Luke, Zack, they're all gone now. Fangs is gone. We're once again the monsters. Creatures of darkness. We can hear the dogs now, see the artificial rays from their flashlights and spotlights through the broken windows. The humans have declared war. They intend to eradicate and remove every last one of us. This is war. And I will stand and fight. I know how this is going to sound. I know that it sounds impossible. Insane. Bat shit crazy. God knows I've been over it again and again. I've thought of every possible explanation, but I've come up empty every single time. Which means that what happened really did happen. And I need you to believe me. I know it won't change much. What happened, happened. There's no going back or changing that. But I still need someone to believe me. Anyone. For me. For my sanity. I'm not crazy. And this might be my last chance to tell anyone what happened. Tomorrow, I'm going into the attitude adjuster, as they call it here. And no one is ever the same when they come back out of that room. I probably won't even be able to remember my own name, much less the crazy shit that went down seven months ago. So I'm writing down everything in this little book. Call it a journal of sorts. I don't know if they'll actually send it to you like I asked, but I have to try. And I have to hope that they will. Don't feel guilty after you've read it. You wouldn't have been able to change anything. You wouldn't have been able to help. This is for me. Closure. I hope it reaches you, though. It started when I moved to that new place in the old part of town. Remember how excited I was? God, if I'd only known. But at the time, it was my second chance. My last chance. I had a new job, my debt wasn't crippling, and I was sober for the first time in three years. Katie had even said that if I stayed sober for six months, she'd let me see the kids over the weekend. The place was pretty run down, but it was big. I figured I'd start restoring it, getting it back into shape after I saved for a couple of months. New paint, replacing the tiles, fixing the ceiling, and putting in some new roof tiles were the major things I'd have to address. I'd rebuild the porch and replace the deck in the backyard for family barbecues I dreamt we'd have. I had a large backyard for the kids and even a big open basement I'd like to have converted into a nice gaming area once I'd installed a new floor. The house was fairly isolated, right at the end of the street, number 113, Harriet Drive. The closest neighbors were about a kilometer away as most of the surrounding places were empty. It wasn't the greatest neighborhood, but I'd lived in worse. It was right on the edge of the woods, and there was a new path that led down to a small stream where I'd have liked to take James fishing. Moving in didn't take long. Didn't have much. A few pieces of furniture, my bed, my clothes, and the kitchen stuff you sent me when I got out of rehab. It only took me half a day, even on my own. Two days later, everything was in its place, and I was settling in nicely. I'd even bought an extra chair and some cheap paintings to give the living room a little more homely feel. I was happy. It genuinely felt like I was getting my life back on track. 
I worked hard, and I was exhausted in these evenings, but it felt good. I was working on my second chance. Weekends, I slept in, worked on the house through the day, and watched old movies on the DVD player you sent me. It was a simple life, but an honest one. I hadn't really craved a drink for months, and not at all since I'd moved in. Like I said, I was happy. About two months after I moved in, I took some time off. I had built up a considerable amount of vacation time, and I wanted to really get cracking it by getting the house in the better shape. Saving for the materials also went quicker than expected, since I didn't have a lot of expenses, and I still had some of Dad's money he left me. So, I bought the materials and got started. I painted first. The whole house, inside and out. I hired a laborer, Kevin, to help me, and I was surprised we managed to finish the first coat in one day. Three nights later was when it started. I just finished making myself dinner when I heard it. A light knocking. I stopped, cocking my head and listening again. Nothing. Thinking someone might be at the door, I headed over and opened it, but there was no one there. Shrugging, I closed the door and got my dinner. I was just about to sit down and put on another movie when I heard it again. Tap, tap, tap. This time, I could more or less pinpoint where it was coming from, and it sounded like it was coming from down the hall. Setting my dinner down, I walked down the hallway, straining to hear the knocking again. I was just passing the basement door when I heard it. Tap, tap, tap. It was the basement door being knocked on. I recoiled. Someone was in my house. I slowly retreated back to the living room, keeping my eyes locked on the basement door. I reached for my phone on the kitchen counter and called the police, keeping the basement door in my sight. A woman operator answered, asking me what my emergency was. I think there's someone in my house, in the basement, I whispered, picking up the large knife I had cut the chicken with. What's your address, sir? 113 Harriet Drive, The Willows. My name's Derek Reed. A unit has been dispatched. Are you able to leave the house? She asked, just as I heard the knocking again. Yes, I'm moving to the door now. I whispered and started to the front door. Moving slowly, I tried to keep the basement door in my sights for as long as I could, and when I couldn't anymore, I sprinted to the door, ripped it open, and jumped down the dilapidated porch. I stopped at the street, turning back to look at my house. With the door standing ajar, it almost looked like a great monster was about to devour me. A chill ran up my spine at the ominous thought. Sir? The operator asked. Yeah, I, I'm outside. I'm standing on the street. Okay, a unit is only a few blocks away. They should be there any second. Please wait for them. She barely finished her sentence when I saw the police car turn the corner up the street, heading in my direction. The car pulled up and two officers got out. A young woman and an older man. Are you the one who called, sir? The woman asked, quickly summing me up in the house. Yeah, there's someone in my basement. Okay, sir. Please, stay here, she replied and then started to the house. It's the third door on the left. I called after them, and she raised her hand in thanks. They stopped on the porch, pulled their weapons, and entered the house. A few minutes went by, and I nervously watched the front door, every now and then scanning the area in case the intruder had managed to elude the police and make a run for it. Soon, the officers emerged from the front door. The older officer was talking into his radio, and the woman approached me. It's all clear, sir. There's no one in your house. I was relieved, but also embarrassed. Are you sure? Did you check everywhere? Patiently, she nodded. 
There is no other exit from the basement except the door, and all the other windows and doors in the house are closed and locked. Sir, I'd like you to put the knife down. Looking down, I was surprised to see I was still clutching the knife. I was gripping it so tightly that my knuckles had turned white. I dropped the knife on the sparse grass on my front lawn. Looking up at the officer, I saw her eyebrows were raised. <sighs> Sorry, I guess... I was just really scared. I just grabbed it. God knows what I thought I would do with it. I ran a shaky hand through my hair. That's okay, sir. Why don't we go inside you can tell us what happened. We went to the house, and I was somewhat cautious. Looking down the hall, I saw that the basement door was open. The officer placed the knife which she had picked up on the counter. I took a seat in front of my cold dinner, and the two officers stood opposite me. Tell us what happened. She identified herself as Julie Rossi by her name tag. The man was Greg Rickards. I took a deep breath and told them about the knocking. Officer Rickards raised his eyebrows. So, you heard a noise coming from your basement and you called the cops. It seemed as if he wanted to grin. <sighs> no... Well, yeah, but it, it wasn't just a noise, it, it was a distinct knocking. Three knocks and then nothing, and then three knocks again, against the door. What could have made that noise? Well, any number of things. But my first question would be why an intruder would knock against the door in the first place. Officer Rossi gave him a disapproving glance, but he didn't seem to notice. Sir, well, we can't tell you exactly what made that noise. It most certainly wasn't an intruder. Maybe it was just the wind. Or the house settling down. Do you live here alone? Perhaps you have somewhere you could possibly stay just for tonight? No, no, that, that's okay. I'll, I'll be fine. Thank you for responding so quickly. I walked in the door and actually heard Rickards chuckle as they crossed the lawn. Asshole. Closing the door, I turned and rested my head against it. Taking a deep breath, I stopped in front of the open basement and looked into the darkness. Nightfall had come pretty quickly, but the basement was a dark place to begin with. I flicked the light switch for the basement and waited as the fluorescent light bulb slowly flickered to life. Taking another deep breath, I started down the stairs. The old wooden stairs creaked loudly as I made my way down. Everything was the way I remembered it. Nothing seemed out of place or odd. Shaking my head a little, I walked back upstairs. I switched off the light and pulled the door shut. And just as the door latched, the knocking came again. Loud and clear. There was no mistake. I jumped back from the door, slamming into the opposite wall. How? What? What the fuck? I was just down there. There was nothing there. A knocking came again, and this time much louder than before, and then it was followed by a giggle. It sounded like a child, maybe a girl. Without thinking, I jumped forward and yanked open the door. There was nothing. I stood there flabbergasted and gripping the door and panting like a wild animal. Slowly, I closed the door and immediately the knocks came again. Before the third knock fell, I opened the door and I was met with the same sight as before. Nothing. Even the knock had been cut off. I slammed the door and backed away into the living room, collapsing onto a couch which had a good view of the basement door. I groaned a little out of fear and frustration as the knocks started up again. It seemed the pauses between knocks were random. Sometimes it was seconds, other times it was minutes, but it was always three. Every now and then I could hear, or thought I could hear, a little girl giggling. What the fuck was going on? What? 
was doing that. What I wanted to do was get out of the house, but I had nowhere to go. The knocks were freaking me out, but the laughter was pushing me to the point of absolutely losing my shit. I could have gone to a motel, but then what? I'd bought this place. I couldn't stay in a motel indefinitely. Call someone? <laughs> Who? Katie? Kevin? And say what? I got up and moved to the door. I opened it and then retreated back to the living room again. I waited for almost five minutes, but nothing happened. So the knocks only happened when the door was closed. I stood up and retrieved my cold dinner. Hungrily, I ate, continuing to eye the doorway to the basement. Placing the dishes in the sink after finishing, I also drank a glass of water. It had been almost half an hour since I'd opened the door, and there had been no knocks since. And no giggling. I was feeling a little relieved, but apprehensively so. As if it was too good to be true. I gathered my phone and headed to my upstairs bedroom, making sure to never turn my back on the basement. Running the last few stairs and the short distance to my room, I quickly turned and slammed at the door, locking it for good measure. I left all the downstairs lights on, but I decided that it was a necessity. Breathing a sigh of relief of being seemingly safe and secure, I went about my pre-bed business. It was still early, but I was tired. And besides, I did not want to be downstairs got into bed, grabbed the book I was reading, planning to read for a few minutes and then go to sleep. But I must have fallen asleep almost instantly. I awoke to a bright and warm morning, and for a few moments, I'd forgot about the weird events of the previous night. I stretched and yawned, but mid-yawn it came back to me. I stopped, and then actually laughed out loud. In the bright morning sunshine, the curious knocking and giggling didn't seem nearly as scary. I mostly convinced myself that it didn't happen at all, and that it had been the work of my overtired imagination. You called the cops. Well, yeah, that was embarrassing. I got out of bed, planning to go downstairs and make myself a big breakfast. When I noticed that the bedroom door was open. I stopped mid-stride. I locked it last night. I stood, welded to the ground, suddenly cold as ice despite the warm morning. I nervously glanced around the room and spotted footprints. They were small barefoot, and human. They could only have been left by a child. They were pitch black, as if whoever had left them had walked through tar. They made their way in through the door and up to the side of the bed. They then turned around and headed back out the door. I stood motionless for several seconds more trying to make sense of the bizarre scene in front of me. I looked down at myself for some reason, and I sucked in a breath. My torso, arms, and legs were all covered in blood-red scratches. I felt along the scratches on my left arm, but there was no pain, only the vivid sensation you get after your leg or arm has stayed in the same position for a long time, almost like pins and needles, but not quite. I was scared. Someone, or... And before I could stop the thought, something had been in my bedroom while I slept. Someone had managed to open my locked door, come to my bedroom, and do something to me. While I slept! Slowly, I crept forward, deciding to follow the tiny black footprints. They led away from my door and down the stairs. I followed, first gazing down the stairs for a few moments before taking the first step down. 
The black footprints never diminished as they would if you stepped in mud and then walked a few steps on. Each one was as black as the previous one. The footprints going to my bedroom and those coming back were exactly the same shade of black. I reached the first floor landing and saw that the footprints led to a closed basement door. The same basement door that I left open the night before. Fear had completely enveloped me, but curiosity drove me forward and before I could talk myself out of it, I'd opened the basement door. I switched on the light and I could clearly see the footprints coming up the stairs and then going back down again. My feet seemed to have a mind of their own, for they started down. My breath was coming in quick gasps. The basement was stuffy, which was nothing new, but there was an underlying smell in the air. A rotten smell, the smell you'd get down by a creek or a swamp. I was positive I'd not smelt it the day before. Reaching the basement floor, I saw where the footprints had started and where they stopped. They led to the middle of the room and then vanished. I stood, staring at the spot where they'd started and stopped. There was nothing close enough which could be climbed upon, so there was no explanation. Suddenly, the basement door slammed and the light went out at the same time. I screamed, literally like a little girl. I tried to turn and run up the stairs, but in my rush, I somehow tripped over my own feet. I went down hard, and for a moment, I just laid there. My heart was pounding like a jackhammer. My breathing was wild, but all else was deathly quiet. I could not see an inch in front of me. It, it was absolute darkness. I was about to try to get to the stairs in a more calmly manner when I heard a shuffle behind me, roughly where the footprints had started and ended. I sat up and turned around. Another shuffle. This time it sounded like a wet footprint. A high-pitched moan escaped my throat and I caught my breath, somehow thinking that if I stayed quiet that whatever it was would leave me alone. A giggle came out of the darkness, a sound which caused tendrils of panic to run through my already tense body. Derek, came the sing-song whisper out of the darkness. Come play with me, Derek. A cold and clammy hand gripped my wrist and I lost it. I ripped my arm away and sprung up, blindly scrambling toward and up the stairs. I stumbled again and again and almost fell back down the stairs, but finally I reached the basement door. I flung it open, tumbled into the hallway. Jumping up quickly, I slammed the door shut and collapsed against it. I heard another giggle coming from the other side of the door, and then three soft knocks. What the fuck was going on? A little girl? Was my house actually haunted? This shit doesn't happen in real life. Get out of the house. A different voice in my head said, Why are you still here? It almost pleaded. But no. Something was definitely happening, but I had nowhere to go. This was my home, and I was stuck with whatever was going on. Eventually, I got up and went back to my room. It was only then that I noticed all of the footprints were gone. I sighed. I had planned to phone someone, maybe the cops, but no one would believe me now without at least some sort of evidence. I quickly showered, deciding that it would make me feel better, and while drying myself, I saw that the scratches on my body were fading too, but a blue, almost black handprint was forming on the spot where I had been grabbed. It was a small hand. Like a child's. I was exhausted, and it was only 10 a.m. I decided to head out for breakfast, to clear my head, and try and make sense of what had happened. I called Kevin to tell him that we wouldn't be working today, and I headed off to a cafe close to my house. I didn't have much of an appetite, 
but I forced myself to eat a considerable breakfast, and after a couple of cups of coffee, I was beginning to feel a little bit like myself again. I went through all the events of the previous evening and that morning, and I could only come to two possibilities. Either my house was actually haunted, or I was going insane. Exiting the cafe, I noticed a bar down the street, and something awoke in me that I hadn't felt in a very long time. I'd always called it the thirst. Heaven knows the things that happened, or which I'd imagined were cause enough to sit down and have a nice relaxing drink, but... It wouldn't be just one, would it? No, it wouldn't. Turning my back on the bar, I headed back to my car. I spent the day window shopping and eating something small at almost every cafe or restaurant I saw. I was wasting time. I, I didn't want to go back home. I was on my way to the next eatery that I'd googled when something occurred to me. Sooner or later, I would have to go home. Did I really want to get home at night? This made me stop, and I knew I'd have to get home before dark. I sighed, said a small prayer, and headed home. Nothing was out of place. Everything was as I left it, and all the lights were still burning. I was full from basically eating the whole day, so I decided to just head up to my room. I first stopped in front of the basement door once again. I opened it and quickly flicked on the light switch. To my surprise, it came down. I debated on going down, but quickly scrapped that plan. I closed the door, leaving the light on, and headed upstairs. I locked the door again and moved the dresser in front of it. Looking at my makeshift blockade, I again pondered my sanity. I took another scalding hot shower and brushed my teeth. It was still early, but I was exhausted. I just slipped into bed when three loud bangs erupted from downstairs. Not knocks, bangs. As if someone was slamming with an open hand against the door or window. I threw the covers off, but then froze. I listened and waited, and after a few moments, those bangs came again. One, two, three. This was followed by a girl laughing. Even the giggling had escalated, I thought. I reached for my phone on the table, but then paused. What if I called the police again and they found nothing? They would think I was wasting their time, or that I was crazy. Maybe you are, an unfriendly thought answered. Bracing myself with a couple of deep breaths, I got out of bed and walked to my bedroom door. I put my ear against the door above the dresser and listened, but I could hear nothing. Everything was deathly quiet. I was just about to move the dresser and unlock the door when three more bangs slammed into my bedroom door. I yelled out and fell back. The bangs made the entire room and windows shake and a photo frame of the kids I had on the dresser toppled over. I crawled backward toward the bed. Another set of bangs rattled the door and then another. The pauses between them were getting even shorter until there were no pauses. It was deafening. A girl was screaming on the other side of the door, hysterical, maniacal screaming. The room shook and the windows rattled and it seemed that the door would explode inward at any moment along with my eardrums. I pulled my knees up and hugged them and soon I was screaming at the top of my lungs, pleading for it to stop. And suddenly it did. With tears streaming down my face, I waited for the next set of bangs. But they never came. It felt 
finally hours went by before I could summon the courage to get up. Slowly, I moved to the door and listened. Again, all was quiet. Waiting for several minutes, I moved the dresser and unlocked the door. Peering out, nothing seemed out of place except for a trail of small black footprints leading to and away from the door. The one picture I had hung up in the upstairs hallway had fell from the wall and lay in a pile of broken glass. The other upstairs doors were all closed, just like they had been before I went to bed. I slowly stepped around the broken frame and moved toward the stairs, trying to look everywhere at once. Reaching the stairs, I stood there for several minutes, looking down. The footprints seemed to mock me. I realized I was still gripping my phone in my hand and debated once more if I should phone someone, anyone. But again, I struggled to come up with an explanation or a scenario where I wouldn't seem crazy. Surely the footprints would disappear again. Just go look. If you don't like what you see, get out of the house and then you call. Slowly I descended the stairs. Everything was quiet. Reaching the first floor landing, I saw that all the downstairs doors were open. Except the basement. Moving cautiously forward, I glanced into every room I passed, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. Again, I did not turn my back on the basement, but rather turned and walked backward toward the living room. The living room was in disarray, with pictures and small ornaments on the floor, and even the small table I ate my dinner on was toppled over. I stood still for a moment, trying to figure out what to do when three more knocks came from the basement door. They were soft again, like the knocks I'd heard the first time. I turned to face the hallway and was just in time to see the farthest door just before it slammed shut, and then the one next to it, and the one next to it. The doors slammed shut with such a violence that seemed unreal. I found myself retreating for the umpteenth time that day. The final door slammed shut and all was silent again. But then the basement door clicked open. Slowly. Painfully slowly, it swung open, its rusty hinges protesting. And that's when I heard it. The sound that made me lose the final bit of self-control I had. The basement steps creaking. Someone or something was coming up those stairs. At first I was frozen. I was absolutely terrified. I couldn't think or move or scream. I just stared at the open doorway to the basement. Another whimper escaped my throat and new tears started rolling down my cheeks. Whatever it was had reached the final couple of steps, and I could hear shallow breathing coming from the darkness. Two eyes appeared, and it seemed that that was what I needed to regain control of my limbs. I sprang toward the front door, reaching it in three bounds, but it would not open. I yanked and pulled at the door while simultaneously trying to look back over my shoulder at the thing that approached. Looking down, I saw the door was locked and cursed my own stupidity. I quickly unlocked the door, but still it wouldn't open. I could hear the thing approaching down the hall, the shallow, rattling breath getting closer. Despair almost took me then, and I knew in my heart that whatever was coming was somehow keeping the door closed. With every ounce of strength, I pulled, and the door came unstuck. Spilling out of my front door, I risked a final glance over my shoulder, but saw nothing. I went sprawling. I tripped on the edge of the sidewalk and I heard the girl giggle again. Derek. The girl's voice sang, though I knew it was no girl. Come play with me, Derek. I was up in a flash and went sprinting down the street. When I thought I was far enough and relatively safe, I stopped under a streetlight and made the decision to call the cops. 
I explained that someone was in the house and that I would be waiting a couple of blocks down the street. They took much longer to arrive this time, and I was surprised to see it was officers Rossi and Rickards. I was sitting on the sidewalk, inspecting my wounds from the tumble I'd had when they pulled up. Mr. Reed, you all right? Rossi asked as she approached me and saw the blood on my knees and elbows. Yeah, I'm fine. I, I fell while I was running. I got up and she asked me to tell them what happened. Now, I'm not an idiot. I know how it would sound, especially after I'd called them the day before. So I left out the part about me opening the door and uh, knocking to find nothing. I left out how I'd found child's footprints in my room and that a girl was talking to me about playing with her. I left out the part about said girl grabbing me in the darkness of the basement, how my bedroom had shook from the banging and that a girl had been screaming hysterically minutes before. I left out how downstairs doors had all slammed shut. I left out how the basement door had opened on its own and something had come trudging up the stairs. I shortened it to me hearing something downstairs after I went to bed and seeing someone heading down in the basement. So, they put me in the back of the car, radioed the situation into HQ, and headed down the street to my house. Pulling up, they told me to wait in the car, and they once more headed into my house, weapons drawn. A couple of minutes later, they reappeared, and then quietly spoke to each other on my front porch. Rickards then spoke into his radio, and Rossi came and got me. There's no one inside, she said, and she looked at me as if she felt sorry for me. <laughs> are, are you sure? I stammered, hugging myself like those grief-stricken women you always see in the movies. Positive. We went through the whole house, and nothing seems out of place. At this, I cocked my head to the side. Nothing's out of place. When I left here a while back, the house was in shambles. The furniture was knocked over and pictures I had hung were on the floor. Rossi looked at me curiously. Follow me, she said, and led me back to my front door. I didn't move. She turned and saw that I was frozen to the spot. Her face softened. Perhaps she could see I was really frightened. Come on, Mr. Reed. We're still here. You're perfectly safe. After another moment, I reluctantly followed her. She led me into my living room, which was completely spotless. All the pictures were hanging where I hung them when I moved, and all the furniture and ornaments were in their correct and upright positions. Even the dishes, which I'd failed to do the day before, were clean and on the drying rack. What the fuck? I whispered. Mr. Reed, are you feeling all right? Rossi asked me and laid a hand on my arm. My mind was running at a thousand miles per hour, and when she touched me, it brought me back to this horrible unreality. I jerked away from her touch, and she held up her hands. Well, take it easy, Mr. Reed. We're here to help. I'm sorry, I, I just... She nodded. She understood. She sighed and looked me in the eyes. Mr. Reed, have you been drinking? She asked gently. What? No, I cried, having heard that question a million times before. What followed was never good. Are you on any strong medication? She asked a little more firmly. I sighed, suddenly angry. No, I'm not drunk, and I'm not on drugs, and I'm not crazy. 
I said a little more forcefully than I'd intended. Okay, calm down. Rossi looked over at Rickards, who was still outside. And she shrugged. Sir, I really would recommend that you stay somewhere else tonight. You have obviously had a very emotional day, and getting out of the house, even if it's just for a night, might be a very good idea. I was about to protest. Tell her to go fuck herself, but... Then I saw the logic in what she was saying. Tomorrow would be a new day, and Kevin would be here to start on the second coat of paint. If something crazy happened again, at least I wouldn't be alone. You might be right. I'll go stay at a motel. Would you mind waiting for me so I can throw a couple of things in a bag? I asked, genuinely, not wanting to be alone even for a second in this house. She agreed, and I quickly headed upstairs. I noticed that the broken frame was somehow repaired and hanging on the wall again. I paused in front of it, a shiver running through me. It was like going crazy. I put on some clothes and threw some more clothes, my toiletries, and a book into a bag. When I returned downstairs, they were waiting for me in the living room. Ready to go? She asked with a small smile. Yes, and thank you for waiting. I, I really appreciate that. She smiled again and we headed outside. I locked up, thanked and apologized the officers, and then got in my car. I headed to a nearby motel and checked in for one night. Walking to my room, I saw a bar across the street. Shaking the thought off, I entered my room and headed into the small bathroom. Splashed my face with water and looked at myself in the mirror. Was I going crazy? What was going on? A drink would help you calm down. I straightened, frowning at the tired-looking man in the mirror. It's not the first time I had a thought like that since I got out of rehab, but I was always able to brush it aside. And it never had any real power over me. But this was different. It wasn't just the silly, weak voice that had tried to get me to drink after rehab. This voice had substance, power. I found myself actually considering it. A drink would calm me down. After what I just experienced, or believed to have experienced, maybe a drink wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. And if I'd only imagined it, I was pretty much fucked already. I stared into the mirror for a couple of seconds more. No. You've been doing so well. Been sober for so long. Don't throw it away. I sighed. Walked over to the bed and fell down on it. I would not go for the drink I so craved. Switching on the TV, I found an old documentary about crocodiles and settled in, hoping I might be able to forget what was happening at my new house, or in my mind. The night wore on. I couldn't shake the memories of what had happened earlier, and the more I thought about the police, the way Rossi had looked at me, the more I thought that I might have imagined it. Could it be? Could I have imagined everything? Was I going through some sort of psychotic break, a uh, mental breakdown? Suddenly, I was back in my living room. I was standing at the kitchen counter again, staring down at the hall of the basement door. Slowly, it creaked open. Fear overcame me. I was paralyzed. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. A hand emerged from the basement, a black hand with inch-long nails. My legs gave in and I collapsed to the floor. A moment later, a great monster had stepped into the hallway. Its skin was black and wrinkled like old leather. Large horns grew from its forehead and it had a flaming red eyes and long fangs. It stood, glaring at me, and a guttural growl rose from its throat. It sprang forward, moving as quickly as nothing I'd ever experienced before. Bearing down on me, I cowered into a small ball, and I awoke as I fell off the motel bed. I sat up, taking in my surroundings. 
I was soaked in sweat, and my breathing was heavy. Taking deep breath after deep breath, I waited until my breathing returned to a semblance of normalcy before getting up. I stood in the middle of the hotel room, indecisive. Fuck it, I said out loud. I headed out the door and across the street. It was a dive bar, and it was empty, save for two men sitting at the bar. The eagles were softly playing over the speakers, and the news was on mute on the small TV behind the bar. I walked up to the bar, and the bartender came to take my order. He was a young man, early twenties, with a silly-looking goatee and an earring in his left ear. What can I get you? Double Jameson. Neat. Coming up. He turned around and poured my drink. He served it to me in a tumbler and was about to move away again, but I stopped him. Wait. He turned around again. I drained the glass in a single gulp. The whiskey burned on its way down, but it was a familiar, comforting burn. Relief washed over me and I immediately felt better. I gestured to the bartender with the glass to pour another. He smirked, but took the glass to refill it. I savored the second drink. I sipped at it while going over the night's events again. Every drink was followed by another drink, and as soon I was drunk. It was a comfortable feeling, one that I knew well and realized that I'd missed it. The disturbing events of the evening didn't seem as important anymore, and the constant fear I'd felt since those first knocks had melted away. I kept pouring the drinks down, not wanting the feeling to disappear. I woke fully clothed on the bathroom floor of my hotel room. I had a crippling hangover. My head felt as if it would burst at any moment. Shame filled me almost instantly. I had thrown away my sobriety. Taking a moment to gather myself, I carefully got to my feet. Looking in the mirror, I saw vomit on my chin. I looked at the toilet and saw more vomit on and around it. Disgusted with myself, I flushed the toilet and immediately took a shower. Feeling a little better, I cleaned to the bathroom and got dressed, popping a couple of painkillers I always kept in my toiletries bag. It was already two o'clock. I went to check out of the hotel and thought about getting some food in me. Next to the bar across the street was a small burger joint, and I decided a greasy burger was just what I needed, but when I sat down, I had entered the bar and was ordering a beer. I sat staring at the golden liquid bubbling away in front of me, and the eternal war waged. You might as well drink it. You already pissed away your sobriety last night. No, get up and leave. Go home. Kevin will be working by now, wondering where the hell you are. This continued for some time. I ordered a burger while the debate went on, and even finished most of the meal without touching the beer. But the burger was really greasy, and the bun was dry, so I became very thirsty. At least that's what I told myself. So I took a sip. Soon the half-finished burger stood forgotten on the side of the table and I'd finished two more beers. i just started on my first whiskey of the day when my phone rang. Mr. Reed? Where are you? Kevin. I, uh... I just went out this morning for breakfast and a couple of things, but I got held up. I shook my head at myself. Ashamed not ashamed enough to not take another sip. Oh. Okay. He sounded distracted, almost upset or... scared. Kevin? What's going on? I asked, setting my glass down. Nothing. I started painting again because the door was open. I assumed you left it open for me, but... What is it? It's just that I keep hearing this knocking. It sounds like it's coming from the basement. 
I went down to check, but I didn't see anything. But it keeps happening. I could swear I heard a little girl laughing down there. My entire body went cold and my mouth dried out. A thought then occurred to me. Kevin, listen to me. I didn't leave the door open. I locked it. Get out of that house. Now. There was a pause. Why? Kevin asked, clearly confused. Just do it, please. Get out and wait for me down by the road at the intersection. Mr. Reed, are you okay? You're not making a lot of sense. Just do it, goddammit. I cried and the other patrons of the bar turned to look at me. There was another pause and then I heard three distinct bangs in the background. Kevin cried out and I could hear the terror in its voice. What the hell? What's happening? Get out of the house, Kevin. I yelled into the phone, getting up from my table and heading to the exit. Hey, buddy, you didn't pay. This is a bartender from the night before. I stopped, taking out my wallet and tossed all the money I had on the table. Quickly, I exited the bar and headed to my car across the street. The noises coming from the phone were not encouraging. I could hear the banging, though now it was the same consistent explosion of noise that I'd experienced the night before. I could hear the girl screaming through the chaos. Kevin was screaming in terror, but I figured as long as he was still screaming, that it was a good sign. I got into my car and was soon speeding back to my house. Suddenly there was silence from Kevin's side. Mr. Reed? Kevin? Are you okay? Where are you? I... I think I'm okay. I locked myself in your room. Okay, that's good. Now, listen to me very carefully. You have to get out of the house. Now, go. Get out. Run down the stairs and get out. Don't wait. Don't stop. Don't do anything. Just get out. What's happening? Kevin asked again. Kevin, go. Now. I screamed into the phone. Okay, I'm going. Stay on the phone. I ordered him as I sped across a red light. I could hear his heavy breathing and whimpering through the phone. Faintly, I heard a door, and I assumed he was exiting my bedroom. You can do this, Kevin. I encouraged him. I'm going down the stairs now. I'm in the hallway. What the... There's footprints all over, he whispered. Just keep going. You're almost there. I'm in the living room now. Wait. What's that? Don't stop. Get out, I urged him. The door. The basement door is opening. Oh my god, something's coming up the stairs. He was petrified. Kevin, run. Get out. I screamed again. There was a pause, a moment of absolute silence, broken only by our panting. And then Kevin screamed. It was a blood-curdling shriek, and I heard the phone drop to the floor. Kevin's scream continued for what felt like an eternity, and then he was silent. What had just happened? I still had the phone to my ear when I heard the sound. It sounded like footsteps, but they were uneven, almost like something was limping. It also sounded like it would sound if you were walking through mud, squelching is the word that came to mind. Terror seized me. I almost lost control of the car. Finally, I heard shallow, rattled breathing coming from the phone. The same breathing I heard the night before. I wanted to hang up, to end the call, but I was paralyzed. How I didn't cause an accident, God only knows. The thing on the other side of the phone then said something. It was barely a whisper, but I'd heard those words before. 
Come play with me, Derek. Suddenly the phone crackled. Static shot into my ear and the line went dead. I pulled over. I gripped the steering wheel in a death grip, my knuckles turning white, and I took a few deep breaths. I had to decide what I was going to do. Call the police? I was sure if they showed up again and there was nothing to find, they'd haul my ass off to jail. But what if there was something? I had to go check first. To make sure Kevin was... Okay. I pulled off again, and a couple of minutes later I turned into Harriet Drive. I slowed down and approached my house at a crawl. front door was closed. All seemed quiet. Parking the car, I left the car running and the door open. I wanted a fast getaway if the need arose. I slowly walked to the front door and paused on the porch. Listening, I couldn't hear anything, even after I pressed my ear against the door. Reluctantly, I opened the door and pushed it open. I stood on the threshold of my own house, afraid to enter. The smell of paint was clear, but there was a faint, swampy smell underneath it. Except for the painting tools leaning against one wall, everything looked exactly like I'd left it the night before. There was no sign of Kevin. He'd said he was in the living room, but I couldn't see him. Shaking my head at what I was about to do, I took a few tentative steps into my house. I still couldn't see Kevin anywhere. I took a few more steps and slowly the basement door came into view. It was closed. The front door slammed behind me with a force that caused the windows to rattle and I screamed, Fuck this, I'm out. I turned on the spot and ran to the front door but again I could not get it open. This time it wasn't locked, and no matter how hard I pulled, yanked, and groaned, it would not budge. Without thinking, I grabbed the extender pole that we used to paint high, hard-to-reach places and scrambled to the window. With all my might, I swung the pole into the window, but the pole bounced harmlessly off it. A gasp escaped my lips. What the fuck? I went to town on the window. I swung again and again. Each time, the pole bounced off the window without leaving so much as a crack. I tossed the pole aside and lifted the nearest chair I was able, using all my strength to throw it at the window, but it had the same result. The chair crashed to the floor in a pile of broken wood as the window held firm. Panic took hold of me. I was trapped. Standing in the middle of my living room, I tried to think of something I could do. I had to escape. I reached for my phone, and as I punched in the emergency number, I heard it. Tap, tap, tap. A scream of fear and anger and frustration burst from me involuntarily. Tap, tap, tap. Louder than before. Tap, tap, tap. The knocks were coming faster and faster and I heard the girl giggling again. I pressed the call button on my phone, my eyes locked on the basement door. The operator answered. I rambled off my address and that I needed help. Before the operator was able to respond, the phone was ripped from my grasp by an unseen force and flung against the wall where it shattered into pieces. I whirled around like a madman, trying to see everywhere at once. Tap, tap, tap. The knocks drew my attention back to the door. I waited, panting. And then the bangs came again. It emanated from the house itself this time, and it was deafening. Bang, bang, bang. Soon the pauses had disappeared as before, and the house was shaking and roaring. I held onto the dish chair for support. The volume of the bangs increased and I felt a warm liquid trickling from my ears. The girl was yelling again and I swear I was hearing it inside my head. The bangs stopped just as suddenly as the previous night and the ringing in my ears told the tale of my damaged eardrums. A moment later I was flung across the room as if a wire had been attached to the back of my pants and I had been pulled with extreme force. I slammed into the wall opposite of the hallway and I bashed my head against the wall, causing me to crumple to the floor in a heap. 
dazed, I lifted my head and a searing pain tore through it, blood pouring from the back of my head. Faintly, I heard it. Tap, tap, tap. I heard the basement door open again. I was directly opposite the hallway and I had no line of sight on the door itself. Groaning, I tried to get to my feet but slumped back against the wall. Again, I heard the creaking of the basement stairs as something ascended. Again, I tried to get up, and this time, I managed it by holding onto the kitchen counter. I heard the top of the stairs creaking, and this was soon followed by shallow, rattled breathing. A giggle came from the basement as I staggered for the front door again, using the furniture to support me, completely forgetting that I'd tried the door already. Reaching the door, I collapsed against it. I tried getting it open from the floor, but it wouldn't budge. I heard the footsteps reach the top of the basement, and I turned toward the living room. The steps were uneven, as if it was limping, and it sounded as if it was walking through mud. I gave up on the door. It seemed that there was no escape. I tensed as the thing neared the corner and I pulled myself into a ball. Finally, the thing turned the corner. That's what it was. A thing. It was not of this world. I saw a very pale, almost white figure rounding the hallway corner. It looked like a little girl of about nine or ten, frail and thin. Snow white hair topped a sunken, haggard face. Its mouth was open as if it was trying to suck in all the air it could, and yellow, rotten teeth protruded from behind its blue lips. But the worst thing was its eyes. Pitch black eyes stared back at me. There was no white to be seen in those eyes, just solid black. There was only one emotion in those eyes. Hate. Pure. Hate. Those eyes seemed to look into me, and a coldness I'd never known before washed over me, causing my body to go limp and to untangle from the ball I had retreated into. My bladder let go, and urine streamed down my leg. I could not look away. He was moving in a staccato, jumpy way, as if all joints were rusted, and getting them to move required force, which then suddenly caused them to shoot forward. A thick, black liquid covered its feet, but where it came from, I could not say. The thing lifted a hand and pointed at me. Derek. It sang, though now it did not sound like a little girl's voice at all. It was a high-pitched whine, like a conveyor belt moving too fast, movements before it snaps. Come play with me. In the blink of an eye, it was right in front of me, and it reached down and gripped my arm. A pain I'd never imagined shot up my arm. It was a a cold pain, a cold, burning pain, like when you hold a big piece of ice for too long. The cold moved through my body, and in an instant I was shivering. I tried to scream, but the cold had robbed me of my voice. Breathing was becoming difficult, and I saw a faint vapor rise from where it held my arm. Almost like smoke. It lowered its face to mine, and I thought it attempted a smile, but it did not work. Its face seemed to crack at the attempt. It was only inches from my face, and I gagged on its foul breath. It smelled like death. The thing then seemed to inhale deeply, and inside of me there was a pull. It felt as if something was trying to leave my body. Physically, it felt like I would vomit, but it was a more intense, disturbing feeling. It straightened and turned, staring off back the way it had come, dragging me behind it like I was a bag of potatoes. I assumed it was heading for the basement, but I was absolutely powerless to do anything about it. We reached the dark doorway of the open basement, and it looked down on me. We're going to play forever, Derek. The voice grinded inside my head, scratching away at the last threads of insanity I had left. A bang on the door behind me interrupted the thing and it let go of my arm. I looked back into the living room just for a moment. It looked as if the thing was debating its next course of action. Another bang on the door made it aside, and in an instant it was gone. 
I suddenly had control of my body, my vocal cords, again, and after taking a deep breath, I screamed. I screamed like I'd never screamed before. I think I would have never stopped screaming had the police not kicked down the door. I was dazed, barely conscious, and Rossi and Rickard stormed into my house, guns drawn. Rossi quickly found me while Rickards jumped over me and went to the basement. She knelt beside me and inspected my injuries, and I saw her recoil when she looked at my arm. I looked as well, and saw that a large black handprint was on my forearm, similar to the other one, but much more severe. It looked like frostbite. Rossi instructed me to stay still, and that an ambulance was on the way. I heard Rickards yell something, and Rossi went to look. Moments later, handcuffs were being slapped on my wrists, and I was being told that I was under arrest. For murder. What? What are you, what are you talking about? I mumbled as another flash of pain shot through my head. Rossi replied, but darkness took me. You mostly know the rest. I blacked out, was treated for a concussion and frostbite on my arm. My hearing was also severely damaged. I was almost completely deaf in my left ear. They found Kevin's body in the basement. They'd shown me pictures in the interrogation that followed. He seemed to have been drained. Not a drop of blood or water was found in his body. He looked like a mummy. It was like he'd been sucked dry. He charged me with murder. I don't really blame them. I had a shit ton of alcohol in my system from the night before, and I'd been drinking that very day. What were they supposed to believe? Although whenever I brought up the question of how I killed them, how I would have drained them, they only mumbled softly about an accomplice. Marks on my arm were also explained by that same excuse, as was my damage to ears. Basically... They didn't know what the fuck happened, but they sure as shit didn't believe my story. And they realized that my story wasn't going to change, that I wouldn't slip up because I truly believed what I was saying. They transferred me to the psych ward, and soon after that, the mental hospital where I currently reside. I don't know what I expect you to do with this story. Even if you do believe it, I... I just needed to tell someone other than the cops or the head doctors. One thing I do know. Do not go into that house. I can hear them coming to take me to that room, so I don't think we'll speak again. I didn't kill Kevin. If you believe me about nothing else, please believe that. I'm sorry about everything. I love you, sis. You've connected with a new friend in the jungle. An arrow appeared at the top of my phone screen. Above it was a username, Eddie Jokes. Below, a distance as the arrow bobbed with my motion to keep pointing at the funny guy, Eddie. Four meters. I looked down the train car and saw an older, heavy-set man with a long, black and gray beard sitting further down on the opposite side. He didn't look like he was that jolly. In fact, he looked a little ill-tempered and morose. But he had earbuds in and the arrow and distance were right, so it must be him. Turning back to my phone, I hit play. My ears were suddenly filled with the bright sounds of K-pop and I burst out laughing. So, what's it called? I shrugged as I took a bite of my sandwich. Share jungle? It's weird, but it's kind of cool. Mari looked over her salad at me skeptically. It sounds weird and dumb. 
meeting creepers and their creeper stuff. Laughing, I rolled my eyes at her. <laughs> You're so dramatic. It's not like that. It's just this app that, like... So, like, if you're listening to some streaming app or whatever, and you have Share Jungle on, other people that are close by will get a pop-up that you're near, and they can click play to hear what you're listening to. It's like a weird social experiment way of finding new music and learning about people. I smirked. Or, if you see a cute guy, you can use it as a conversation starter or something. She grimaced. Uh, I guess. But, what, the app just listens to whatever you're doing on your phone? I shook my head. No, you have to log into your streaming apps and give permission. They have some beta feature where you can share media files on your phone if they aren't copyrighted, but I didn't turn that on. It's not like it's listening to your phone calls or something. Mari pulled out her phone and poked at it skeptically. I don't know. I'm going to be at the airport for hours today, so maybe it'll be funny. She shot me a dark look. But if I get hacked or something, you're buying me a new phone. I groaned as my phone started chiming in the dark of my bedroom. Picking it up, I saw it was four in the morning. But I also saw it was Mari. She'd only been in London for three days, but I could tell things weren't going great with her father. The trip was supposed to last another two weeks, but I wondered if she'd last that long. Wiping out my eye, I answered the call. Bitch, you know it's still in the middle of the night here, right? I... I know. I'm sorry, but I really needed to talk to you. Sitting up, I felt instantly awake. I'd been friends with her since we were twelve, and I'd only heard her sound scared like this a couple of times. What's wrong? Are you, are you okay? There was a pause. Her voice was trembling when she spoke again. I don't know. I think I may be in danger, but it may just be me being an idiot, too. Working to keep the frustration out of my voice, I tried again. Just calm down. Tell me what happened. So, well, things with Dad have been about like I figured. It's okay, but when he suggested I get out and explore some yesterday, I took him up on it. Got on one of those big red tourist buses. The double-decker like in Harry Potter or something. It was cool, and London is pretty neat. Haven't been here since I was like eight, so it's all pretty new to me. But I made the mistake of picking the long tour. After the first hour, I had another hour to go, and I was getting kind of bored. I didn't want to get off because it was pricey, but I also started fiddling with my phone more. I decided to listen to music while I looked at the scenery. I told you I installed that Sheer Jungle app, and it was kind of fun using it in Atlanta and Gatwick. I didn't know if I'd had any luck on the bus, or like how many people ever even heard of it over here, but I picked up a couple. Your music was shit, so I kept going, but it did make me feel a little less lonely sitting up on that bus by myself. Then I got a new notification. A new user, his name was The Path, came on. And the notification was different than the others. It, it said personal media files under the name. I almost didn't click it, but then I did. And at first, I almost busted out laughing. I, I thought I was listening to a porno or something. I could hear this woman screaming and... I'd figured some dude had started watching porn and forgot he had Share Jungle on, but it wasn't that. I started hearing banging. It sounded like someone beating on a wall or maybe breaking through a door. And the woman was screaming louder and begging. This wasn't some role play either. She was really scared. And the stabbing sound started. It's weird. I, I've never seen someone get stabbed or even get really badly hurt. But as soon as I heard those sounds, I knew what it was. My mind hadn't even had a chance to go there yet. But, but 
I knew. My heart was pounding now, and I couldn't help but cut in. Maybe it was just a horror movie or something. I know it says it won't stream stuff from your phone that's copyrighted, but half the time that shit doesn't work, right? Could have been something like that. I could feel her thinking on the other end of the line. It's possible, but... I don't think so. The woman... The sounds she started making when they were killing her... I could tell she was crying now. I've never heard a movie that sounded like that. Letting out a shaky breath, I nodded to the empty room. <sighs> okay. Sorry. What did you do? I didn't know what to do. We ran a stoplight when I started listening, so I'd hoped the distance would go up when we started forward again, but it didn't. Wherever it was, they weren't on the street nearby. They were on the bus with me. At first, I just turned it off and put my phone away. I didn't want to act strange or anything. Draw the attention, you know. So I just sat there, terrified, staring out at whatever we were passing by. When we got to the next stop, I got off the bus and walked a couple of blocks. Went to a coffee shop, just sat there for a while, trying to calm down and give the bus time to get far away. It wasn't until I pulled back out my phone that I realized I'd accidentally started playing my own music when I'd put it up on the bus. And I had a notification on the top of my screen. You've connected with a new friend in the jungle. Josie 08 is listening to your sick beats. I... I'd never had someone connect to mine before, so I didn't know. Or at least I didn't think about it. When someone listens to your stuff, you get notified too. You, you, you get the same arrow and distance they do, and you see their username. Whoever was on that bus with me, they knew I'd heard. If they were paying attention, they knew I was on the bus with them, and that the distance got further away when I got off. It freaked me out. Uh, of course it did. Even though it was expensive, I called a taxi and waited until it got there to go back outside. I even had it take a weird route back to my dad's, just in case someone was trying to follow me. I know, all this sounds overdramatic, probably. Honestly, I was starting to feel silly by the time I woke up this morning, freaking myself out over some dumb thing I heard when no one had bothered me, and it probably was a porno or a horror movie or something after all. Telling myself it was to just show I wasn't scared anymore, I made myself open share jungle again. One nearby user popped up right away. The path. Jesse, they were only 30 meters away. They were outside my dad's fucking house. I... I don't know what to do. I don't have anything to tell the cops or something, and if I tell Dad, he'll think I'm just being stupid. But I know something is wrong. There's no way that's a coincidence. Somehow they followed me here, and you're the only one that'll believe me. Jesus. I, I mean, yeah, I believe you. Doesn't mean you're in real danger, but who knows? People are crazy, and you can't take a chance with that. I think you should talk to your dad about it anyway. He might know someone at the police station that can look into it, or at least be on the lookout if someone is creeping around. She sighed. <sighs> yeah, maybe. I just don't know that it'll do any good. I felt myself growing irritated. If he won't listen, then fuck him. Come on back home. Murray gave me a little laugh. Yeah, maybe I will. He's at a meeting right now, but when he gets home this afternoon, I'll talk to him about it. You just... Just go back to sleep. I'll text you later. You sure? We can talk more if you need to. No, I'm, I'm okay right now. Talking to you made me feel a little better. Good night. Then she was gone. 
I had trouble getting back to sleep, finally getting up at 6 and heading into work. I kept checking my phone throughout the morning, and when I didn't hear anything from her by noon, I called her. No answer. Tried again a couple of hours later, and then a few minutes after that. The last time, her father picked up. He told me that the police were there, and let him answer the call when I called back again so soon. That he'd gotten home an hour earlier to find the house had been broken into. He started crying then. His words barely comprehensible islands of meaning in between his racking sobs. He found Mari on the stairs. Someone had stabbed her to death. That was over a month ago. In some ways it seems like time has stretched on forever, while in others it seems like it just happened. I've tried to be there for Mari's mother and little sister, but it's been hard. Not just because I miss her so much, but because I feel like I'm to blame. If I'd given her better advice, if I'd made her call the police right then, if I'd not told her about that fucking app. Funny thing is, I still have it on my phone. Much as I hate it now, I can't quite make myself get rid of it. I think a part of me feels like I deserve the punishment of being reminded every time a pop-up notification or I see it on my home screen. I haven't really used it since then, though. I don't want to be around anyone, much less connecting to random strangers. Until yesterday. I forced myself to get out of the house and walk around, and before long I found myself back at the same sandwich shop that me and Mari used to go to all the time. My chest felt like it was going to cave in as I picked the same outside table we'd sat at when I first told her about the app. I managed to hold off until I ordered. Not my usual, but this weird club sandwich that Mari always used to get. And I took out my phone and opened Share Jungle. If I was going to open my wounds, I needed to get the salt deep. The search icon spun for a second and then found one connection. Reading it, I dropped the phone to the table like it was hot. I couldn't be right. The path. Fighting for breath, I started looking all around. There were people on both sides of the street, but no one that stood out. Glancing back at my phone, I saw that the arrow was pointing down the street and said the distance was about 200 meters. I didn't know what to do. Should I go look for them? How would I find them? And if I did, what would I do? Get myself killed, most likely. And I could call 911, but did I have enough to tell them that they could help? Would they even take me seriously? Blood pounding in my ears, I fished around in my bag for headphones, finally finding them. I connected to the phone. I have hoped the name and the arrow would be gone by now, but it was still there. The path. Personal media files. 201 meters. I hit play. My head was suddenly filled with screams of pain and terror as my gorge began to rise, my eyes filled with tears. That motherfucker. That motherfucking. It was Mari. I was listening to Mari get murdered. Ripping out the earphones, I jumped from the table and ran in the direction the arrow pointed. I didn't care anymore. Any fear or worry had been replaced with blind rage, and I just wanted the compass to guide me to the thing that did that to her so I could tear it apart. 160 meters, 115 meters, 92 meters. And then it was gone. I went to the police, and after waiting an hour, I talked to a detective that listened attentively before politely pointing out that I had no recording to play for them and no leads for them to investigate. 
He said that even examining my phone wouldn't amount to anything, as they didn't have a way of tracking the app users without a search warrant to the company, and I didn't have enough to get them one. I left there last night angry and depressed, wondering what else I could do until the path found me again. When I got home, I checked every room thoroughly and locked myself in the bedroom, steak knife in one hand, phone in the other. I was finally falling asleep when my phone chimed. You've connected with an old friend in the jungle. My heart sped up. The path. Putting in my headphones, my hands were shaking so bad I had to hit the play button twice before I could get it to start. When it did, I felt my brain shudder as a wave of deja vu passed through me. It was two people talking, and I, I recognized the voices. It was me and Mari. It called? Share jungle. It's weird, but kind of cool. It sounds weird and dumb, meeting creepers and their creeper stuff. Vision swimming, I looked toward the window and then back down at my phone. The path. Personal media files. 45 meters, 41 meters, 36 meters. I've told this story many times, and without exception, it has provoked the same reaction. Disbelief. No matter how difficult it is for people to process, and no matter how many conventional explanations have been offered, this did happen, and it's an experience I'll never forget. It started with a friend of mine, Stuart, who had always been interested in the supernatural. I, on the other hand, had no more interest in it than the next person. Of course, I'm curious about whether there is life after death, and for selfish reasons, but I prefer to leave these things to themselves, as I find the entire subject morbid. I'm sure I'll learn the truth in the end, but until that day, I'd rather not ask the question for fear of the answer either way. Stuart was captivated by the paranormal. He lived and breathed it, but our friendship had developed through another of his passions, film. And although he often asked me to go on one of his investigations, I always replied that I preferred such things to remain on the cinema screen and to stay there. We'd go for a few beers regularly at Farland's Bar on the Main Street or catch a film at the local cinema with some mutual friends. And then suddenly, I didn't see or hear from him for a couple of weeks, which was peculiar, but... I assumed he was simply busy, and so I left it at that. It was 3.04 a.m. when he called. I was angry at first that he'd woken me up, but when I heard the sound of his voice, anger quickly bled into concern. Stuart was always such an upbeat guy, but that night his voice sounded distant, and there was a new uncertainty. I had never sensed before, which quivered underneath each word, unsettling me. I need you to come and get me, he said in a low whisper. What's wrong? Where are you? I asked. I can't talk for long. Just come to the old botanical gardens at the edge of town. His breath became increasingly labored and agitated as he spoke. Stuart, if you're in trouble, call the police. No, he exclaimed in a unique mix of a whisper and a shout. I'm not meant to be here. They'll arrest me. Just come to the botanical gardens and send me a text when you're waiting outside. I have to go. And with that, he hung up. Ten minutes later, I was in my car and driving to the edge of Windham Town. It was an autumn night, as I passed landmarks which were usually familiar to me. Each twisted tree branch and leaf-covered garden took on a more threatening nature than I was used to, the night revealing an unapparent side of the town that I loved. It seemed strange to me that Stuart would be in the botanical gardens at night. He 
quite regularly went away on nocturnal investigations of abandoned hospitals and other supposedly haunted locations, but that place didn't seem like an obvious choice for such things. In the past, the gardens housed beautiful exotic trees, plants, and wildlife under a massive greenhouse which must have been over 200 feet in length, but it had been shut down for a few decades. I guess the townsfolk didn't frequent it often enough to keep it afloat. Even when I was a kid, it was just fodder for a rock or two, shattering many of its countless panes of glass, each held in place by a rusted frame, although admittedly my throw fell short more often than not. I know my dad talked about going there when he was a kid, amazed by the place, a self-contained tropical landscape even during Wyndham's bleakest winters. I pulled up in front of a large metal fence. It had been erected years previous, encircling what was left of the botanical gardens and its grounds, no doubt to dissuade new generations of rock throwers. On its gate hung a mud-smeared sign displaying the words, No Trespassing, in no uncertain terms. Stuart obviously hadn't bothered with the warning, no doubt more interested on catching a glimpse of something otherworldly inside. I left the engine running as it was a little cold out, but just as I unlocked my phone, I received a text message. Kill your lights. And so I did. Then another message quickly followed. Don't call me, whatever you do. I began to develop the distinct impression that Stuart and I were not the only ones present out there in the night. My nervousness crept into my breath, and as I sat there looking into the darkness of the gardens, partially obscured by a web of fencing, I felt as though something was staring back. For a moment, I was unsure how to proceed, but was then startled by another text message and frightened by the thought that Stuart was in there somewhere and about to be grabbed by a burly security guard, a local gang, or worse. I adhered to his instructions. Follow my light and get me the hell out of here. And there it was, Stuart's torch flickering for a brief moment before being engulfed in the darkness once more. I opened the car door, the night uncontrollably cold as it washed over me. Just thirty minutes later I had been cozy, sleeping in my bed, and now this, climbing over a fence and walking to God knows what. The fence rattled as I pulled myself up, and as I reached the top I looked across the pitch night and seriously considered going any further. Then Stuart's torchlight flashed again, and I knew I couldn't leave him. Possibly injured or trapped with the chilled October air threatening worse. I jumped down from the fence as quietly as I could, my feet muffled by the whispering grass below. The ground was wet, and the unattended grass and bushes which surrounded the main building made progress difficult. The light flashed again. Three times, in fact, before Stuart turned it off once more. I was sure now that he was growing more agitated, and so I continued in the direction of the once glass building to reach my friend as quickly as possible. But my footsteps were uncertain, and my eyes struggled to pierce the dark. I took out my phone and used the LED light on its back to see where I was going. As I walked toward the large, shadowed outline of the garden building, I grew increasingly apprehensive. There were only three possible reasons why Stuart turned on his torch intermittently. One was that it had broken somehow. Perhaps he could only get it to flicker into life every few minutes. Another explanation would be that the battery was low. Perhaps he was lost and switched it off to conserve what little juice it had left. Last explanation was much less appealing. I switched off my light at the thought of it. Perhaps he didn't want to draw too much attention to his location. Maybe he was frightened that someone else would find him first. The darkness stood before me, a wall of black which blanketed it all. It was hopeless. I was going to have to switch the light on to see where I was going. 
I remember when I was 14 and had nearly fallen down an old drainage shaft when I was camping at night with friends. I always shuddered thinking about that, about how bad that fall could have been. I needed to see where I was going. If a security guard came and found me, then that was better than falling into the darkness somewhere unseen. And yet, the thought of a night guard seemed far-fetched. The old building had been derelict for years, and it seemed unlikely that the town would waste money on wages for someone to patrol an area at night. Finally, I reached the building. Its base made of red brick which had held up surprisingly well for all its years of neglect. The same cannot be said of the frame. Large metal struts reached up to the sky, forming a huge domed roof. I could see pieces of the frame lying on the floor, and in the dim light of my phone, I thought I saw strands of it hanging from the roof, just waiting to break off and impale any unwelcome trespassers. I cringed at the thought of my friend lying somewhere inside, perhaps impaled or trapped by falling metal and masonry. Stewart's light flickered again, and then disappeared. It was indeed coming from inside. And as I ducked under and then through one of the countless empty metal frames, I realized that he was somewhere in the middle of the building. Despite having no solid walls, there was an echo of sorts to the place. Subtle, my footsteps ricocheting gently off the concrete floor and then filtering out into the bleakness of the night. That was when I first noticed it. The cold. Sure. It was always cold in October, but as I slowly proceeded, shards of broken glass cracking occasionally under my weight, a chill in the air grew more pronounced. It bit in my exposed face, and I was convinced that if I looked in a mirror, my nose would have been bright red. There, Stuart's light. It was closer now, and for the first time I saw the light reflect upward for a moment and illuminate Stuart's outline. As I drew nearer, the night closed in and the cold was now becoming almost unbearable. My hands ached from the bones outward and the air froze my insides with each breath. I was now only a few meters away from the center of that old glassless dome and my friend. The light flickered again. But it seemed obscured somehow, as if Stuart had turned his back to me, the light from his torch bathing him in illumination for only the briefest of seconds. Stuart, it's Mike. You okay? I said softly. Yes. Let's get the hell out of here, he replied nervously. And then, a new noise joined us. Just as I opened my mouth to whisper across to Stuart and ask him if he was hurt, the sound of broken glass breaking under weight echoed from behind. It came from somewhere behind us, and it was subtle at first, but there was no doubt. I could hear movement. Yes, footsteps, more pronounced. They were moving toward us. Then they stopped. All I could hear was my heart thumping, the adrenaline of our apprehension coursing through my veins. Quickly, I switched off the light from my phone, hoping to obscure our location. Someone else is here, I said. I know, whispered Stuart. They've been wandering around me for hours. Then the footsteps moved again, this time circling, prowling under cover of the night. I knew then why Stuart had called me. Someone was taunting him. They'd been in that broken glass dome all along, terrifying my friend and me in the process. No doubt he'd been terrified. But now there were two of us, and whoever was circling, they were surely but one. I decided we would act, pick a direction and stick to it. I moved close to my friend and whispered. Follow me. That word still haunts me. The light from Stuart's torch came on once more, but you see, it wasn't a torch. And whoever was standing right in front of 
was not my friend Stuart. A strange light emanated from inside the throat of what I can only describe as the figure of a woman. The light bled out through translucent skin which seemed to take on the appearance of night and the light forced its way up and out of her gaping mouth. At that moment, Stuart appeared from the darkness, grabbed my arm, and before I knew it, we were running. Our feet scrambled over broken glass, pummeling it further into smaller shards. I looked over my shoulder at the hard figure, light source and all, was chasing us. The light from her throat and mouth seemed to pulse with intermittent fury, and as we reached the metal frame of the building, she screamed words of hate and anguish, a rasping anger filled with nothing but contempt for the living. Before I knew it, We'd escaped the gardens, that screeching creature seemingly constrained to the boundaries of that derelict building. We reached the fence, and then the car, and then home, where I fixed both Stuart and myself a large whiskey as we tried to calm our nerves. As it turned out, Stuart had been on one of his investigations, as I thought. He'd heard stories of strange lights coming from the old botanical gardens building at night and thought he would check it out. He got more than he bargained for, that's for sure. At first, the old building seemed empty, but as the night drew on, he felt as though he was being watched. Suddenly, the batteries in his torch drained. The spare batteries he always carried with him were equally unresponsive, and so he was left in darkness alone. It was then that he heard the footsteps and a woman's voice who simply kept saying, I know you're here. I know you're watching me. To Stuart, it sounded like she was pacing up and down, occasionally standing over him as he hit on the floor. God knows what would have happened if she'd found him. I'm sure you've realized by now that Stuart claims he never called me on his phone or sent any text messages. Indeed, he dropped into the darkness and still hasn't found it at this day. We talk about that night occasionally, and Stuart hasn't been on investigation since. He lost his stomach for it, and who can blame him? My unease with the memory of that night, however, doesn't revolve around the fear of meeting some spectral creature in the night. I intended to stay as far away from any haunted place as I can. It's more of a fear which grabs me occasionally when I really think about what that night meant. If that horrid apparition is in any way what happens to us when we die, that we're filled with such hatred for the living, I prefer to believe that there is no life after death. For what we encountered that night was a twisted reflection of all that is good in each of us. And if no good can remain, I'd rather not exist at all. It was just past midnight. I'd been driving for a very long time. The stretch of road cutting through the desert landscape was seemingly endless and completely void of life. There weren't even cacti on the side of the road where I expected them. Then again, it wasn't exactly bright enough for me to see very far. Without any differentiation on almost a perfectly straight route, I found myself dozing off periodically. The only thing keeping me from falling asleep was an overwhelming sense of terror. I was being chased chased by something. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was gaining on me and I had to get away, but sleep deprivation outweighed my fear. I could feel myself losing the battle. It was at this point that I woke up, drenched in a fear-induced sweat. My anxious and soaked state was caused by a nightmare. It was the same nightmare I'd been experiencing for weeks. None of it made any sense. I'd never even seen a desert, much less driven through one. I lived near the beach for crying out loud. I spoke to my physician about my state of affairs, but he blamed it on an overabundance of stress. He told me to relax, take a few sick days off work. Work, however, was the only thing keeping me awake. I found myself nodding off at odd times during the day, sometimes even while driving to home from my workplace. 
didn't make a whole lot of sense, seeing as I was always well rested. Despite my troubling dreams, I still managed to get at least eight hours of sleep each night. My doctor didn't shed any light on this either, simply telling me to take some caffeine pills during the day to keep from drifting off at the wheel. It would seem the situation was my burden to bear and mine alone. After another long day of work, I ventured home to inevitably get some shut-eye. Before finishing my commute, I unsurprisingly found my eyelids growing heavy. I tried to keep my thoughts on the road, but my mind yearned for sleep, begging me to close my eyes and drift off. I wanted to pull over, but before the wheel could be turned, sleep took hold. These were anything but ideal circumstances. In a seamless fashion, I went from driving home to riding along that empty stretch of road in my nightmare. Its usual pattern was broken up with a pair of lights off in the distance. I could barely see them, but they were definitely there. This had never happened before. I was still being chased, but something was off. I kept driving nonetheless. After a long monotony of driving through unchanging landscape, the lights came into focus. They were headlights, belonging to a truck driving in the opposite direction toward me. As it drew closer, a loud horn let out. The sound grew louder until, finally, I awoke from my untimely slumber. Without even a proper moment's notice to react, I viciously cut the wheel, swerving to avoid oncoming traffic. My car had wandered onto the wrong side of the road while I was asleep. Upon narrowly escaping disaster, my eyes cautiously looked back to see if there was now a pile-up in the middle of the highway. To my relief, there was not. Even so, I was lucky to be alive. This is when I took notice to my whereabouts. It was almost the exact same spot that I'd been before becoming unconscious. My dream may have felt longer, but in actuality, it only lasted an instant. Thank goodness for that, otherwise I would have been a goner. With my newfound understanding, I drove the rest of the way home, successfully avoiding sleep's unrelenting grasp. After getting undressed and putting my things away, I let my body fall into the bed, completely missing the pillow. Still, I fell asleep almost instantly. My dream recommenced as I found myself driving down that same desert road. The lights were back off in the distance. I again felt the fear instilled in my racing heart, knowing that something was out there chasing me. After roughly ten minutes of driving, the headlights came into view, revealing the same truck. This was then followed by the sound of a car honking its horn. I then woke up from the nightmare. Upon waking, I found myself driving into oncoming traffic. I swerved, mimicking my motions from earlier in the day. After doing so, the confusion set in. What was going on? Where was I? After looking around and getting my bearings, I knew exactly where I was. Back on the highway, driving past the same cars I encountered on my way home. My next thought was to check the time. No, 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 this couldn't be. It was roughly the time I almost crashed. How? Was I still dreaming when I woke the first time? I couldn't be sure. Instead of dwelling, albeit frazzled, I drove home and went to bed, hoping to forget the whole ordeal. The next dream housed the very same desert and road that I had grown accustomed to. Sure enough, off in the distance were the mysterious headlights. I drove onward, giving into my dream's lackluster narrative. And though fearful, I was curious as to what would happen upon reaching the truck. Would I wake in the comfort of my bed or on the brink of destruction on the highway? As it came closer, I heard the usual honking sound and woke up. What I woke to was anything but alleviating. I swerved again, almost hitting the same car for a third time in the row. 
This couldn't be happening. There was no way this was a dream. E even as weary as my brain was, I could tell the difference between fantasy and waking life. I was stuck in a time loop, unable to escape from a constant cycle of the day's events. But how could I break free? If I sought help, no one would believe me. Even if I had someone in mind, my eyes wouldn't stay open long enough for me to reach them. I drove to the safety of my home, managing to elude the clutches of sleep along the way. It was easier this time, anxiety keeping me alert but frightened. If only I could stay awake long enough to figure everything out. After undressing and putting my things away, I walked over to my bed, knowing I had no choice but to give in. Right as my head hit the soft blankets, I slept once again. Just as before, I was driving down that same desert road, staring off at those ominous headlights in the distance. This was completely mad. How much longer could I endure this torment? In a fit of rage, I hit the brakes and the car stopped. I had never done this before scared that whatever was behind me would catch up. I didn't even know if this would work. Even stranger, once I stopped, the feeling of being chased vanished. How peculiar. I was relieved to be without fear, but I still felt overtired even while asleep. I needed answers too. I got out of the car and looked toward the headlights in the distance. I estimated that I would have about 20 dream minutes before it caught up to me and jolted me awake in the middle of traffic again. Without a moment's hesitation, I headed off into the desert scenery, hoping to find a solution. I didn't know if it would harbor one, but I was running out of options. My hunt for answers would be on foot, and stopping the car seemed to render it immobile. As I walked, I saw rock formations in the distance. One in particular caught my eye. And an opening carved into its side. Upon reaching it, I stepped inside, noticing a flicker from within. There was a small fire illuminating the stone dwelling. There was also a person sitting on a wooden stool. I say person, but it wasn't really. It had skeletal legs and hands and wore a purplish cloak, hiding all of its other features. Not even the fire could light up its face, almost as if it didn't have one. Before I could examine the being any further, it looked up at me and spoke. It's about time. I didn't even have time to respond. I awoke in the middle of oncoming cars on the highway. How marvelous. I must have run out of time. I violently turned the wheel, narrowly avoiding a collision. With a new sense of motivation, I drove home again. I knew that whatever that thing was in the desert, it must have had the answers that I so desired. I reached my house once again, tired but focused. I went in, undressed, put my things away, and went to bed. Much like before, I fell asleep in an instant. My dreamscape remained unchanged. Thinking more clearly now, I took a sharp turn to the right and drove off into the desert. I reached the rock formation much faster than before. I got out of the car in haste and walked into the stone's light, and arriving at the same spot I stood in before, I saw a familiar scene. A fire in the cloaked figure. Now was the time to get answers. It's about time, he repeated. Who are you? I asked bluntly. I'm an apparition of the mind and a warning of things to come. A warning of things to come? I asked in confusion. Yes, you're vulnerable. The issue at hand must be confronted, otherwise you will cease to exist. Cease to exist? Confront an issue? Isn't that what I'm doing right now? I demanded specificity. Not in here. Out there. I didn't have the will to argue with it. Fatigue and exhaustion were taking over, and I knew the truck was getting closer. My time was running out. You must. Your brain is at fault. Look within. A solution can be found. I didn't say anything. I just looked at the creature in defeat. 
unable to comprehend its meaning. You're very sick. Face this sickness and reveal its cure. I awoke once again in oncoming traffic. I swerved automatically, relying on my muscle memory to do so, for I was preoccupied with my own thoughts. The creature's words stuck with me, especially brain and sickness. My dream was trying to tell me something, but I was just so tired. What was I to do? In an unfortunate moment of clarity, the puzzle pieces clicked into place. Without a second thought, I sped to my destination. I wasn't going home this time. I was going to my doctor's office. I peeled into the parking lot with so much ferocity that I scared a few people walking out of his office. I opened my car door and jumped out without even thinking to take my keys out of the ignition. I ran into the building and up into his office, swinging his door open, startling the hell out of him and his staff. I didn't care. It was imperative that I spoke with him right then and there. It's my brain, I yelled. What? What are you talking about? He asked, clearly looking angry that I barged in without so much as notifying him first. It's my brain. You need to look at my brain. I was told at this point that I collapsed in the middle of his office, though I can't remember doing so. My doctor rushed me to the nearest hospital and with my words in mind asked them to order a CAT scan after the usual tests were administered. After doing so, it was revealed that I was suffering from a rare condition, one that caused my brain to overheat sporadically without cause. It naturally overheats when sleep-deprived, but mine was doing so even when I slept. This explained why I was always tired. I needed sleep to combat the overheating, but the condition rendered it futile. My brain was unknowingly heating itself to death. It's been a few months now, and I've responded well to ongoing treatment. I feel refreshed every time I wake up in the morning. My sleep is void of nightmares. It would seem that my brain was trying to tell me something all along through my dreams. Maybe I was being chased in the beginning, not by something tangible, but by death itself. Perhaps the time loop I was stuck in was part of the dream all along. The result of a mind on the verge of breaking. Who knows? Either way, one thing is certain whether molded by a higher power watching over me or simply the product of intense coincidence. My nightmares saved my life. Twice, I saw the face in the window, pressed up against the surface, its icy breath fogging the cold glass. At first, it appeared strange to me, The skin beneath its eyes drooping and ripples of flesh exposing the red sensitive strata underneath. It was the winter of 83 and I booked the cabin for three nights. Only three. A break was needed. Somewhere to relax. Somewhere to recover. I had a heart attack two months earlier. A painful, excruciating experience which I would not wish on my worst enemy. Lying there Sprawled across my kitchen floor, the sharp agony had siphoned through my veins, chest, arm, jaw. I lost consciousness, only to find myself in a hospital bed days later. It was my daughter, Jen, who discovered me. Thank God for her. The cabin was to be a retreat, a place far removed from the stresses of my life fallouts from a failed marriage, the pressures of a flagging career, and the ordeal of staring death in the face. Comfort had become a stranger. Fear, however, was now both my enemy and a constant companion. Each beat of my heart was felt, the slightest change of rhythm or palpitation a nursery for terror. The knowledge that at any time the agony of death could be brought upon me by the very thing which gave life seemed perverted an abomination of purpose i now wandered through life like glass afraid that the slightest exertion might shatter me 
The doctors had done their part through surgery and medication. Now it was my turn to help my body heal as best it could. Only time would tell how successful such efforts had been. I was advised to relax, to undertake some limited physical therapy, and to avoid any anxiety or sudden shocks. But how does one avoid a shock or a nasty surprise? By its very definition, a shock is an unknown, unforeseen, unexpected event which lurks in the darkness of obscurity out there, mingled with the fog of yet to come. Around a corner, in the next room, a wrong turn taken or an unwelcome phone call bearing bad news. I found the entire concept of avoiding the unanticipated to be a laughable one. And still... There I was, preparing for the quiet solitude of the countryside, following the advice of the experts and those men and women in sterile white coats. I'd almost ignored those recommendations. Remaining slumped at home, festering, counting the hours and beats of my heart as finite measures of my life. When still, the mind can unleash a terrible onslaught of memories. I thought of Susie. Of the years we spent together now wasted. We'd been happy once, but I'd played my part in where we ended. She came to visit me in the hospital. Perhaps she too wished for some reconciliation, but feeling the gulf between us as she sat at my bedside was worse than any physical heartache. We smiled and spoke the empty words of day to day which litter each and every hospital ward. As she left, she touched my hand for the briefest of moments, and yet I could tell she no longer sheltered the spark she once had for me. She tried to be kind, but some things were done and said and can never be taken back. A fire of resentment which can never be extinguished. They say time heals all wounds, but some cuts are deeper than others. In those bleak days of loneliness, I'd only thought of my daughter to keep me from slipping into a dark depression, and yet she stayed with her mother most of the time. Perhaps I'd been cold to her, too. I knew my failings as a husband, but I'd never conceived that I'd been anything but a loving father. And so I lived for those brief two days a week when I could see her. The in-between times were filled with fear of death and thoughts of worthlessness. Friends, families, doctors, they all urged me to go on a holiday, but I was afraid, scared of my heart giving up, frightened by the possibilities brought forth by an anxious mind preoccupied with the fragile body which housed it. If it hadn't been for Jai, I would have never gone. He visited me several times a week and encouraged me to be as upbeat as possible with his usual quips and jokes. It kept me going, in fact, and finally persuaded me that a few days away in the countryside would do me good. Still, I was terrified of being left alone, isolated, away from things and people. What if I had another attack? Perhaps the next one would be fatal. And even if I could be saved, I'd be too far for help to reach me in time. I needed somewhere that I could relax away from the world, and yet not so far from the wonders of modern medicine. That's why we chose Blackwood Cabin. Jai had visited there as a child. It sat on the outskirts of a large forest, hemmed in on a patch of open ground by a beautiful flowing river on the other side. Despite its seeming detachment from the world, it was, in fact, only six miles from the nearest hospital, which stood near a small town on the boundary of that thick, darkened web of trees. This, and the insistence of Jai that he would stay as well, left me contented enough in the knowledge that help would always be at hand. I could feel myself begin to relax as we left the city, and during the drive we both talked and laughed, reminiscing about our days together at university. For the first time in months, I felt positive about the world, watching the motorway recede in the distance, relinquishing its concrete grip into the wild, untamed, and imposing grandeur of the great outdoors. Only once did I bring up the mention of 
Susie and our separation, but Johnny quickly turned the conversation around to something more positive and fun, as he often did. I held out hope that the divorce would never be finalized, that she'd come back to me, but hope, too, can be an exhausting predicament. So I attempted to filter Susie from my mind as best I could. The single track road weaved its way through Blackwood Forest. We wriggled over six miles of twists and turns and serpentine slitherings before we finally reached the clearing. A large waterlogged patch of wild grass carpeted the area, so much so that we had to park the car a few hundred feet out from our destination for fear of getting stuck. In the center of the soaked, near marshland ground stood the rickety and aging shelter which we intended to call home for the following three days. The cabin itself, small, with one main room complete with cozy log burner and stove, two cramped bedrooms at the back. It had been there for an age, that much was certain, and the darkened timber beams which carried the heavy burden of time above sagged and dipped as they lurched across the ceilings. It had been there for an age, that much was certain, and the darkened timber beams which carried the heavy burden of time above sagged and dipped as they lurched across the ceiling. The smell of moss and bark swathed the air, and the sound of the flowing river on the other side of the cabin bubbled and brewed. Peaceful, yet serene and mysterious. The first day was uneventful, exactly what I needed. Relaxing with the book in front of three large logs, smoldering in the fire and spending a little while sitting on the steps to the cabin, watching the river swell and swarm with the winter currents. It was then that I understood the naming of the place. Peering out across the bobbled grass to the tree line, the forest seemed picturesque, yet impenetrable from a distance, and the clearing where the cabin sat provided only a temporary pause to its encroachment, before it once again continued to blanket the land on the other side of the river. The woodland was dark and black, yes, but full of life, a vibrancy of things, deer, Fox, beetles, rabbits, but I would never have guessed the horrors which lurked between its tightly woven evergreen branches. Many tourist traps survive on tales of ghosts and ghouls hidden somewhere nearby, stories exaggerated by pub landlords or hotel managers speaking of rooms where something ominous walks the midnight hour. Visitors flock to such places hoping to spend the night in a haunted room to glimpse something in the darkness which whispers the thought that life is more bizarre, more interesting than we could possibly imagine. Even that lonely and forgotten cabin seemed to have something of a myth attached to it. In a bookshelf tucked away in the corner of one of the bedrooms, we found a warped old hardback. The papers were yellowed, and while it contained the publication date of 1967, it was certain that it had only ever seen one pressing, left in the cabin to titulate those staying there. The book was called The Beast of Blackwood Forest. Rifling through it, I found that the author had dedicated much of her life to the documentation of the local legend. I had myself heard the stories when I was younger, as I had once dated a girl who lived in a nearby town. All the kids talked about the Beast of Blackwood, a creature which everyone's uncle had seen while out hunting in the forest. Dark, hulking, monstrous. Of course, I always laughed at such things, and no concrete evidence for it had ever been found, but each winter there were rumors, whispers, about something shambling through the woods at night. As the day gave to twilight, I read through some of those pages while Jai stocked the stove and prepared supper. Although I discarded the legend as nonsense, I found the book quite compelling, and the eyewitness testimonies contained therein affected me enough to cause me to see something which wasn't there. Shadows moving outside under the cloak of dusk. I began to feel my heart once more, and decided that it was best to leave the terrors of the horror genre, fact and fiction, behind. My mind was still fraught with the strain of Susie leaving me and the fear of the slightest palpitation signaling another heart attack, so accounts of a terrifying creature preying on those in my immediate vicinity, no matter how preposterous, were not suitable for a fragile disposition. 
The clean country air, on the other hand, was doing me the world of good. After dinner, Johnny surprised me with a bottle of my favorite whiskey. 16-year Lagavulin. I knew that the doctors would frown upon it, but the idea of swishing that warming liquid gold around in my mouth and taking a deep gulp reminded me of something essential. It reminded me of being normal again, of being strong, of sitting in my family home with my wife and daughter, enjoying the finer side of life. A few drams would not be unwelcome. We talked and laughed about the past while playing cards and enjoying, again, reliving old adventures we had traveling together during our university summers with the old gang. I would have happily stayed there, wrapped up in the comfort of those memories for an eternity, and in many ways I wish I could have sunk further into that moment of relief from my recent worries, but that was not to be. Around eleven o'clock, the log burner was running low, and we'd all but run out of wood. Jai drunkenly picked up a torch and decided that he'd go out quickly and gather some more so that we could keep the good times flowing. I didn't protest. I was happy. I was content to allow that night to continue. He was a good friend and insisted that I not raise a finger out there in the cold darkness. He was always braver than me, and I'd be lying if I said that the outlandish thought of something lurking in the woods hadn't left its mark. I watched from the window for a moment as the beam from his torch bounced along the uneven, now frozen grass. The light dropped to the ground for a second, and I heard the drunken, merry laughter of my friend echoing as he picked himself back up before continuing toward the tree line. Smiling, I returned to my book of choice, flicking through a few pages of an elderly queen detective novel, less dangerous than the previous read. After about 15 minutes, I realized how truly silent the cabin was. No noise, no wind, no sounds of life or the living. And for the first time, I sensed something sinister resting in the stillness. Suddenly, Jai burst into the cabin and collapsed on the floor, panting. He turned to the door and kicked it shut with his heels frantically, his eyes wide, panicked, disbelieving. Scrambling back to his feet, he turned a small table on its end and wedged it against the skin of the aging wood under the handle. Help me for Christ's sake, he whispered anxiously. I stood up and rushed to my friend's aid, helping him pack furniture, anything with weight, against the door. It was the first time since the heart attack that I'd physically exerted myself, and it would not be the last. I felt the blood pump through my chest and momentarily quivered at the sensation. I tried to find out what had happened, but Jai was exhausted and distraught. A shiny streak of sweat ran down his cheek as he wheezed and gasped for air. He flicked the light switch, smothering us in a darkness which was only broken by a crescent moon hanging in the sky outside, its slivered light vaguely illuminating the inside of the cabin. Prowling the window which gazed out toward the forest, his stare never broke for a moment from the frozen world outside. We stood there, my repeated questions going unanswered, and slowly my fragility returned. I rubbed my chest for a moment as my friend's anxiety seemed to spread to me. My heart raced and my mind swung like a pendulum between the fear of an agonizing heart attack and the terror etched upon Jai's face. Just what had scared him so badly? I breathed deeply to calm myself, but Jai took no notice. He was too fixated on the darkness outside. It was only when I poured him a large whiskey that he finally broke his silence. I've never been frightened of words, but my friends certainly shook me. There's something out there. I did not reply immediately, but when I did, I could only think to ask. Something? What could he have meant by such an indefinite term? There were no bears in that part of the country, no large predators at all, but it did indeed seem that Johnny had seen something big in the woods. He had been gathering wood for the stove around the tree line of the forest, and as he described, standing there listening to a short flurry of rain tap the canopy above him, I could see the fear grip his insides. 
as it did mine. My heart began to pound harder as Jai stuttered over the words. I saw it moving between the trees, straight for me. I didn't look back, but I'm telling you, it wasn't human. I knew my friend was convinced by what he said, but while I dismissed the notion of an unknown creature stalking the woods outside and perhaps in the attempt hid the descriptions of the yellowed pages of that book which had etched into my mind, I very much did entertain the idea that there was someone out there. Someone dangerous, mad, or perhaps both. My pulse continued to race, and I could feel my heart beating wildly at the thought of a shadowy figure prowling around the outside, watching us, waiting. After finally composing himself, Jai asked if I was okay. His fear now turned to concern for his friend, but I myself was transfixed on one course of action. Escape. I rushed over to the cabin's phone, but on picking up the receiver I was greeted by an icy silence. The line was dead, and what that still, lifeless receiver said about the unseen threat I was sure we now faced was enough to thrust dread into my very soul. I stood there for a moment, desperately trying to formulate a course of action. That serene, peaceful place in the daytime now felt imposing and absent of mercy. I just wanted to go home. Jai motioned for me, then pointed with shaking hand to the darkness outside. It was then that he let out a suffocated whisper. It's there. Looking out to the moonlit night, I saw nothing at first, but as my eyes adjusted to the darkened landscape outside, I finally saw it. Deep down, I'd hoped that Jai had simply drunk too much and spooked himself all out there, but now... Any dream of a simple, harmless explanation was extinguished. Someone was standing there amongst the trees. Just standing and looking bathed in darkness. It was difficult to make out any detail. All I could see was an outline. The outline of a stooped and hunched figure. Its arm wrapped around a tree as if steadying itself. I could not be sure, but it felt as though its stare was firmly transfixed on our cabin. A rickety shelter for the night, which had no doubt seen many winters there before, and perhaps even encountered whoever or whatever was looking at us from across the sodden stretch of icy marsh which surrounded us. Who... Who is that? I stammered. Keep your voice down. Jai snapped in return. And so we whispered and spoke of the hunched figure standing only a few hundred feet from us. It's not a man. Jai kept saying, but I continued in my attempts to dissuade him from that conclusion. I saw it through the trees. It moved. It moved in a weird way. Limping like it was off balance or deformed or something, but moved fast. I have no idea how I made it back. Maybe it won't leave the trees. His eyes widened, and it was clear that a revelation had sprung forth from his mind. He turned suddenly, walking across the room to a table where I left those yellowed pages which spoke of a strange creature living in the woods. Jai thumped through it, shielding the light from his torch as best he could with his hand. As I watched him scan through the contents and flick to what he seemed so animated about, I almost laughed at the insinuation. It's a man, Jai, just someone messing with us but he was convinced otherwise. Look at this, he said, following the text with his finger as he read. Accounts have varied over the centuries, but a central element to the myth states that the beast of Blackwood only wanders from the forest late at night. It has been suggested that the creature uses the thick canopy as protection during daylight hours. Locals claim that it is entirely nocturnal. There's no such thing as the beast... I could feel my pulse thicken as my blood pressure increased at the idea, so much so that I had to sit for a moment to allow my heart to recover its normal beat. Are you okay? I'll be fine, 
Just wait until it gets light and we can leave. Are you crazy? You didn't see that thing up close. It's huge and quick. If it wants to get in here, it will. So, there's a weirdo in the woods. He can wait us out all night, anyway. He's probably just a hunter or something camping in the forest. He'll be harmless. I listened to the words exit my mouth. Even I didn't believe them. There was something about the place. A silence, deathly icy, a sickly sense of dread hanging in the air, hidden between the bark and the moss. I turned to look outside to the grassland which etched toward our car, sleeping in the night chill between us and the brooding forest. We need to leave, or you can stay here and I'll get the police. Either way, I'm going. He turned to look at me sternly. Which do you prefer? I might not have been convinced that it had been an unknown creature that had stalked him through the woods, but by God, I didn't want to stay in that cabin alone. I threw my stuff in a bag as Jai did the same, each of us grabbing a knife from the kitchen for protection. And there we stood, looking at the door, a pile of furniture wenched between it. We dismantled our makeshift barricade as quietly as we could, and then, brandishing our kitchen knives nervously, slowly opened the door. It creaked softly, sucking in the night air which felt cold and bitter, and revealed a slow patter of light rain threatening something greater from the heavens. I might not have been convinced that it had been an unknown creature that had stalked him through the woods, but by God, I didn't want to stay in that cabin alone. Jai poked his head out first, and then after a brief silence, waved me on. We descended the dozen or so steps which led down onto the grass. As we peered around the corner, we could see our ticket home. The car was parked a few hundred feet where we stood, nestled in the last piece of dirt track, which would give way to road and then the safe embrace of home, if we made it. It would take a minute or two to reach, but with knowledge of the figure in the forest lurking around somewhere nearby, it seemed like an eternity away. I slung the strap of my bag over my shoulder, and Jai, mindful of my condition, headed toward the car first. Keep looking around, he urged me with a whisper. The waterlogged grass squelched underfoot, and the rain began to grow more angered, as we stepped tentatively toward the safety of the car. We tried to be as quiet as possible, but even in the moonlight we had to use our torches to see what was ahead of us, advertising our position to anyone or anything in the vicinity. I kept looking out toward the forest, the tree line, the thickening river behind me, but I could see nothing, nor could I hear anything but the raindrops which now battered against the car and splattered on my hood. And then... Jai suddenly dropped. What is it? I whispered over the rain, my heart now beating wildly, throat dried by worry. The rain subsided slightly, replaced by the silence of a landscape petrified, frozen by a winter chill. Jai spoke without turning his head toward me, his breath visible in the beam of my torch. I thought I saw something moving in the tree line. A crack of wood, the sound of the unseen walking over the forest floor. Come on, Jai whispered with urgency, and we broke into a brisk jog. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as my pulse thumped desperately. As we continued on, all I could think of was my heart in the deep stuttered and the freezing breaths I took trying to calm myself. As we drew closer to the car, the faintest wisp of moonlight hung in the air as the crescent above us swung behind a pack of clouds and the world took on a strange icy blue. Stumbling over the grass, we finally reached the gray outline of our ride home. Open the door. Let's get out of here. I pleaded as Jai fumbled for his keys, dropping them to the ground. Bastard, he growled. Instinctively, I pointed my torch downward, illuminating the long, wild grass now whitened with a thick coating of frost beneath our feet. I waited for an instant as I peered down at the ground. I recognized that something was very wrong. Jai was not moving. He hadn't even looked down to see where he had dropped the keys. 
He was staring at something, and the look of sheer panic in his eyes told me that we were not alone. I raised my hand, and with it a beam of light glinted off the car. Two large eyes stared back at me from the other side of the vehicle. A hunched, hulking thing glaring up at us, crouched behind the car bonnet. It shivered, and then again, as it rose up, I saw it for a moment. Wet, drenched hair, mouth gaping, its face a pallid and quivering gray. It groaned loud with a strange, unearthly, and high-pitched undertone which only added to the creature's horrid appearance. Run! Jai yelled. I did not need to be told twice. I dropped my bag and ran as fast as I could. I panted, sweat, stumbled, thrust myself forward with every ounce of energy I had left in me, and as I did so, the first pains came. The freezing cold stung my eyes. I fell twice, helped to my feet by my friend. My heart staggered. It heaved and battered in my chest. I could feel the slight twinge of pain run up my neck, nestle in my jaw. My chest tightened. I cried in terror. This was a heart attack. I yelled out, Help! But all I could hear was Jai running behind me, screaming for me to move faster. Keep going, don't look back. As the cabin came into touching distance, I heard the heartbreaking absence of my friend's footsteps. I knew Jai. All those years, as close as we were, he was always the brave one. Something I had at times been jealous of. The one stubborn enough to stand up to anything. I understood implicitly that he was buying me time, a selfless gesture which helped me to make it to the steps, scrambling up them only to turn and see him staring the creature down. Face to face, the beast shrouded in shards of night. As its hulking mask lunged toward him, a searing pain ran up my neck from my chest. I collapsed to the ground, but he needed me, and whatever life was left in my failing body, I was compelled to use it to help him. Staggering to my feet, the night air stinging in my lungs, I lurched forward, clutching my chest, ready to strike the beast with everything I had left. Before I could assist, Jai appeared from the darkness, grabbed my arm, and threw me into the cabin. He frantically barricaded the door once more. We slumped to the floor, breathless, deciding to keep the lights out. And listen. Shuffling in the darkness, but nothing more. Pain in my chest had subsided slightly. It was clear that the heart attack had begun, but when it would end me seemed uncertain. What? What was that thing? I asked between gasps. I don't know. It wasn't human, said Johnny, solemnly before showing me the knife that he'd used during the fight, now covered in a putrid black liquid. I don't even think this hurt it much. This is crazy. What do we do now? I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. And so we waited. And waited. But the pain in my chest grew steadily, my breath more erratic. I took my pills, but I knew that the old enemy had returned, and that I needed more than something to calm my nerves. If I didn't receive medical attention, there was every chance I would die. Jai stared at me as I sat on the old couch against the window, worried that each breath would be my last. We need to get you to a hospital, he said gently. Yeah, just chopper me in. We both laughed for a moment. Jai stood up and looked outside. He seemed reluctant at first, and no wonder considering what lurked outside, but his concern for me appeared to slowly drown out his fear. I can't see anything out here anymore. The moon's behind those clouds. We might not get another chance. I think I can make it to the car quicker on my own. That, that thing out there, I said, deep down ashamed that my fear of death galvanized the hope that my friend would indeed find the courage to try again. He leaned over me and smiled kindly, patting me on the shoulder. I can do this. It's pitch black.
black out there. You need to use a torch. And then it would see you. I said, wincing once more at the growing pain in my chest. I'll flash it on and off. That way it won't know where I am. Maybe it'll get confused. I don't know. He clenched the torch tightly while looking at the kitchen knife in his other hand. Hopefully that'll give me enough time to see what's in front of me and head for the car. The key should still be where I dropped them. Jai, please wait until morning. But as my friend looked at me, clutching my chest, I knew he'd already made up his mind, and part of me was glad for the hope his bravery provided. Barricade the door as soon as I'm out. Okay, I said, trying to hold back tears of both pain and worry for my friend's life. He gave me a hug, and then he was gone. I closed the door and bolstered it once more with anything I could find. Before pulling myself back up into the couch and looking outside, at first I could see nothing but the black stillness of the forest. And a blast of light. And then another, as Jai's torch sporadically burst into life. Each flash illuminated the landscape around him like a ghostly photograph, documenting his progress toward the car. I could see what he was doing. I smiled to myself for a moment, once more impressed by his ingenuity. He wasn't moving in a straight line, but zigzagging so that his path could not be anticipated. Another flash, and another. Each time, no sign of the creature, and one more precious movement closer to the car. Grass, tree, an anonymous wilderness of darkness, another flash, another patch of grass. He was close. And then... The intermittent light became erratic, moving one way then another, backwards, left, right. Was he lost? Was he unsure which direction the car was? A more horrific thought than entered my mind. Was he being chased? A flash of light. Nothing. Then another. Nothing again. Finally, the light beamed. He'd made it to the car. The light was quickly extinguished, followed by the sound of a door opening. One last flash of the torch. The isolated outline of a hunched figure standing behind my friend. Blood-curdling scream. And then nothing. Jai was gone. The beast had got him. And I was alone. Grief now mingled with fear, feeding the pains in my chest and arm. My friend was most probably dead. I was certain that I would soon follow him. I fell to my knees, sure this was it. The end. Agony ran up my chest once more. There, I kneeled in the darkness, alone resigned to my death. But my heart slowed. My thoughts became clear. They turned to my daughter. Whether a good dad or not, I'd be damned if I was going to leave her fatherless. And what of Susie? I still loved her, and perhaps in those sweet memories of better times between us, I could fix things, bring us back together as a family. She could learn to love me again. It would set things right. My heart still beat. And as long as it did, there was time left yet for hope, for escape, for life. But time to do what? The phone was dead, and all I could do was wait for daylight. Yet that was at least three hours away, and I severely doubted that I would last that long. Never mind that I was unsure that the old cabin door could survive an attack from whatever that hulking creature was which lurked outside. I peered out through the window, the rain lashing down once more, obscuring an already ill-deafened exterior world. And still, I was certain I could see something limping around in the darkness. As glints of moonlight pierced through the charcoal clouds above, I was sure that the attacker was out there somewhere, pacing, circling, waiting. But what was it? 
Was it a man? Or a thing yet to be discovered by science? I did not know where to turn. But all I could think of was getting home to my family. The hopeful, warm embrace of Susie and my daughter was enough to fuel my search for a way out. My only refuge was the book. That volume which I'd mocked so readily before. I had to now consider the possibility that my dear friend and I both came into contact with the Beast of Blackwood. At the start of the day, that idea would have seemed ridiculous, but fear opens the mind quickly to any avenue of escape. I sat at the table and used the light from my torch to illuminate the pages, still shielding it from the outside. What I read intrigued me. The creature had been described since the 1700s, and there was even the suggestion that it had been seen before that, and there were references to the Grey Man of Blackwood's Forest and fragmented accounts from centuries earlier. There didn't seem to be much in the way of 20th century sightings. In fact, the last person to come forward officially had been in 1952, claiming to have encountered a stooped, grey-faced figure with a contorted arched back disappearing between the trees on the other side of the forest. The original myths did not say much about its origins, but it clearly spoke of its motivations. The creature was drawn or attracted by greed. Children would be told to share and be kind, otherwise the Beast of Blackwood would appear from the forest and snatch them away at night. I could not look in the mirror and say that I was never guilty of greed or selfishness, or a number of other petty human frailties, but to be punished in this way seemed cruel, a dying prisoner trapped in the cabin of Blackwood Forest. Returning to the book, the only supposed protection against the creature was light, or being a person without selfish frailty. In centuries gone by, villagers in the local area would line the pass through the forest with burning torches when the beast had been sighted, to ward it away from many unwary travelers. Thud, thud, thud. Each thump sent waves of terror through my body. It was not my heart, but someone at the door. Thud, thud, thud. I hoped beyond hope that my friend had once again managed to evade the creature's grasp. Branching a kitchen knife, I hobbled to the door and plucked up the courage to shout, Johnny, is that you? I prayed that it was. But the answer I was given was not the voice of my oldest friend, nor was it even that of a man, but the shrill cry of something utterly inhuman. A sound which spoke of time and age, and of moss and dank forest. A childlike shriek of unspeakable purpose. The door shook violently as I piled more chairs, pots, anything I could find behind the wooden barrier. The pounding was loud and angered, and the cries continued. I clutched my ears in despair, and then I remembered. The light. The torches of old warding the beast away, I flicked the switch and the porch light came on outside. Another cry echoed out across the empty landscape, and at that, the thudding stopped. I quickly turned on all the lights in the house, now realizing the creature's weakness. I wasn't sure if I would last, but if I could just make it till dawn, maybe the sun would save me. Then I heard it. The sound of something moving, shuffling, climbing. I stood paralyzed at the realization. It came from my bedroom. The beast had gotten in, attracted no doubt by any greed and selfishness I'd harbored throughout my life. Slowly, the door from the bedroom creaked open. My heart pounded, and again my thoughts turned to my family, to my daughter's laugh and the comforting caress of my wife. They fueled me, drove me to a strength I did not know I had. I launched in terror across the room, battering against the door. Even with all my momentum, the creature's hand managed to slip through the gap, its bombled gray skin and black matted hair soaked by the rain. I swung the knife only to miss its arm. The beast seemed to hesitate for a moment, and as it did, I shoved my hand through the gap in the door and flicked on the light in the room. A howl of pain and then nothing. I gasped for air and rested against the door for a time before finally plucked the courage to look inside. A window lay wide open, but the room was empty. I 
closed the window and staggered back into the main room. My heart raced, and while I fought to stay on my feet, a sweeping pain arched through my back and needled into my chest, knocking the wind out of me. I felt like I was going to pass out and stumbled forward, landing on the couch. I breathed slow and deep. Not yet, please, God, not yet. The cabin remained eerily quiet, and in that silence sat the memories of better times, of my daughter playing as a child, of traveling with Jai in our twenties, of Susie's smile. I don't know how long I lay there, but I knew that soon my body would give up. I looked out through the large bay window behind the couch and hoped to see the first welcome rays of sunlight, but I saw nothing but darkness. If I was to survive, I had to make it to that car, outrun the beast, and drive through the forest to a hospital. Or at least a main road. If I ever was to see my family again, to put everything right, the car was my only hope. It was all or nothing. Then suddenly the creature's stilted head rose up from beneath the window sill. The inhuman face pressed against the cold glass, its gray skin sagged and weeped away from its eyes, the moist red flesh underneath visible in the cabin's light. The shock had finished me. My heart stopped for a brief moment and then thudded, struggling to maintain my life. My body went limp, my head resting only inches from the window. Looking up helplessly, I watched as the beast stared into my eyes through the pane of glass. My heart sprang into another deluge of beats, spattering away at the inside of my chest. A sharp pain ran up my neck. The creature's green, tinged stare stabbed through me, and as its breath fogged the glass, I grabbed the only thing at hand, the old yellow book, and thrust it at that putrefied face. Book followed by first shattered glass, countless pieces and shards showered down upon the beast and myself. A scream, a hideous shriek of derision cut through the icy blanket at night as I struck those hard, accursed features again. And again. And again. Its thorn hands waved and flailed, grabbing hold of me, and for a second I thought it was going to tear me from the inside of the cabin, and then the winter frost came to my defense. The bee slipped from its footing on a pipe which clung to the outside of the rickety old shack, and as I clawed at its face with utter disgust, the creature fell to six or seven feet to the ground below. The sound of something heard lying beneath the shattered window broke my daze as I stared at the contents of my hands. Where there once had been eyes, the face now stared eyeless at me. Where there once had been a mouth, the creature gaped wide, lifeless, jawless, and utterly without agency. For in my fading grip lay the torn and crumpled remains of a mask. On the ground below, a man writhed in pain, wrapped in the vestiges of a hulking, false, monstrous suit, the fall having knocked the wind from him. Something then moved from the darkness nearby. A powder of feet, light and agile. Susie. My soon-to-be ex-wife the one I'd adored and agonized over. She screamed, attending to her lover on the ground. My closest and dearest friend, Jai, the beast of Blackwood Forest. Susie looked up at me with hatred and contempt in her eyes, but I couldn't muster anger nor jealousy. All I could think was that I must have been a monster to have deserved such malice from those I loved, those two people I trusted most in the world. I slowly rose to his feet, and yet he could not acknowledge me. He could not look up to the friend he betrayed. And then it came. Finally, my heart began to give in. Not at fright or fear, but at sadness, loss, the anguish of a broken heart. I stood up clutching my chest, and as I staggered backwards, I saw the smiling face of Susie, and then the words of my once trusted friend. Thank God. They embraced beneath the window, as I fell to the cold and solid wooden cabin floor, and yet I did not lose consciousness. The pain was agonizing, but nothing compared to the sharp incisions made by each word spoken from below the window. What are we going to do about the window? Susie asked. 
I would just say that he smashed it during the heart attack. But maybe they'll guess? No, baby, they won't guess anything. He'll be dead. We can start a new life together when the insurance pays out. No, I need to go back to the woods and go home. I'll clean up here and then phone an ambulance when I'm sure he's gone. I almost chuckled to myself as I writhed around helpless on the floor. I hoped that Susie had refused the divorce because of love, because of deep down she still wanted me, but instead it was only to hang on to how much money my death would make her. For a while I heard Jai slip and swear as he attempted to climb up to the broken window once more, but each time he failed to pull himself inside. He then changed his tactic and tried to push at the door, but again I had barricaded it effectively and obviously he didn't want to force it and leave further evidence of foul play. It was then that he started shouting in anger, even cursing my name of all things. It was only a matter of time before he got in, cleaned to the place and told the police how sorry he was that his dear old friend's heart just gave up. My last thoughts were of my daughter of never having the chance to fix my mistakes as a father. And I finally passed out. And yet, my assumed death was not to be. I woke to find myself in the white glow of the hospital room, my hand held tightly by my daughter, who slept in a chair next to my bed. The doctor who attended to me said that I'd suffered another heart attack but one which was not as severe as the last one, and that while I was to take it easy, with some therapy I could recover. The police were keen to speak with me. I gave them my account of what had occurred, and they in turn told me all that they knew. My unconscious body had been discovered next to a main road just outside of Blackwood Forest on the outskirts of the nearest town. The cabin was thoroughly searched and was found in the same condition as I had left it, the window smashed, the front door locked and barricaded from the inside. There was no trace of Jai or my wife. I simply could not be found. The only evidence that they'd ever been there were their footprints in the mud around the cabin, accompanied by a third, much larger scent, which led back, deep, into Blackwood Forest. The last time I babysat, I watched someone die. I was in college, and back then babysitting was one of the best ways for me to make extra money. I'd done work study the first semester, but the pay was really low, and the hours tended to suck. And the available jobs were always the ones you got interrupted enough that squeezing in study time at work was hard, especially once I decided to double major and needed access to a laptop most of the time. But babysitting, once I got a good reputation as safe, responsible, and willing to work on short notice, was the best of both worlds. Better pay, shorter hours, and with younger children or stricter parents, I sometimes had two or three hours of fairly interrupted time while the kids slept upstairs. It wasn't always steady work, but the flexibility made it worth it, and usually I enjoyed myself too. The kids tended to be cool for the most part, and... A couple of times I ran into real brats, I just didn't go back again. But Erin was always one of my favorites. Only six, she was both slight and quiet for her age, with long brown hair framing a small featured face dominated by sad eyes that rarely lit up, except for when she was playing by herself and didn't know you were looking. It was strange that I would like her best. There were children I had more fun with and knew better, after all, but I could tell that she liked me, and that such a thing was rare for her. When I took her to the park, she would hold my hand ditfully, and I occasionally gave her a hug. She didn't shy away, as she'd seen her family do to friends and relatives at times. Odd as it sounded, her approval of me made me feel special, and that in turn made her special to me. The night of the screaming and death and terror started out very normal, boring even. I had to study for a test next Tuesday, but aside from that and watching TV, I was actually kind of out of things to do. 
Erin had been up in her room playing when I got there at 7, and I knew not to expect her parents back until after midnight, so by a bit after 8, I decided to check in on her and see if she wanted to come down and watch a movie or something. I could hear her whispering as I approached the cracked door and found myself pausing for a moment, straining to hear what she was saying. No, you're the silly one. It doesn't make sense. I remember frowning at that. I had a lot of experience hearing children playing, including having make-believe conversations between action figures or with some imaginary playmate, but this... It didn't sound like that. When someone fakes a conversation with someone else, especially when it's a child, it doesn't take long to see it's them pretending. When someone fakes a conversation with someone else, especially when it's a child, it doesn't take long to see it's them pretending. Sometimes it's super obvious. They do voices for both sides, for example, but even if they only do their own part, you can tell they aren't really reacting to someone else. Everything they say is expected, following by the path that they're laying out in their own imagination, often with brief pauses as they think of the next bit as they go. There's a kind of bland joy in their voices, but it's paired with a degree of lonely dissatisfaction, like celebrating your birthday when you're all alone. You're tricking yourself into believing the conceit and being happy, and it only half works. But Aaron's conversation was different. I could hear happiness in her voice, but something else too. Frustration, maybe. Even anxiety. And it all sounded real enough that my heart sped up as I opened the door, a darker corner of my brain already picturing scenarios where some intruder has snuck into the little girl's room. Aaron turned and gave me a gap-toothed grin. Hey, Betty. I looked past her to the far side of the bed. The space there was empty. <laughs> hey, short stack. Who are you talking to? Her smile fell away as her eyes followed mine to the carpet between the window and the bed. Just playing. I nodded, stepping to the window. It was shut and locked, and there was nowhere else for anything to be other than... I swallowed. I know it's early, but I'm going to go ahead and do a monster check, okay? Aaron smiled a little. Okay. I held her gaze for a second. She didn't seem scared, but she didn't seem quite right, either. More like she was preoccupied, or... But no, I was... Making this into more than it was, I just needed to get over it. Crouching down quickly, I looked under the bed, terrified that I'd find a man lying under there staring back at me. But no. It was empty too, aside from a couple of books and a stuffed dog. Glancing back at Aaron, I forced a smile. All clear. Standing up, I held out my hand. Want to come down and watch TV? My pizza will be here in a bit and you can have some. The little girl beamed and nodded before giving me a frown. Did you get pineapple on it again? I snickered. (laughs) Only on half. I kept some pristine for the little princess. Giggling, she did a curtsy before taking my hand. See? She's totally fine. Preppier than normal, even. You're freaking out over nothing. Nodding to myself, I took her downstairs, and we started watching some movie that was a bit scary, but didn't seem to bother her too much. The pizza came, we ate some, and I was coming back from getting us more drinks in the kitchen when I saw she wasn't in the living room anymore. Aaron, where'd you go, honey? My first thought was the bathroom. And after sitting down the drinks, I headed that way, but no sign of her in the downstairs bathroom. Maybe she'd gone to the kitchen the other way and I'd missed her. Nothing there either. And no sign she'd returned to the living room when I completed my circuit of the downstairs. I headed up to the second floor then, my heart hammering in time with my hurried steps. 
I was still calling out for her, less now to get her attention and more to warn her not to hide from me as I was starting to think this was part of some prank or impromptu game she was playing. She wasn't back in her room or her parents and I didn't find her anywhere else up there either. I was heading back downstairs, already planning a more thorough search of every room and closet until I found her. When I realized that the front door was now standing wide open. Stomach twisting, I stepped out onto the front porch and looked around. No sign of her out there either. And I was starting to run out of... No, wait. Down at the very end of the street, I saw a dim glimpse of movement at the edge of the street light glow. It was too quick and far away to say for sure it was her, but I needed to check and see. Closing the door behind me, I sprinted off in that direction, calling out to Aaron to stop if that was her. The corner was over a hundred yards away, and by the time I made the turn, I could see the figure even farther ahead, despite the fact that they weren't running like I was. It had to be her, didn't it? It was hard to say in the dark, and I had no idea why Aaron would run off like that, but what were the odds that another person, roughly her size, would be roaming around in the street in the dark right when she goes missing? Gritting my teeth, I forced myself to run harder. I needed to catch up before I lost her. This went on for three more blocks. Every time I thought I was gaining, I'd turn the corner and I'd find her farther ahead. I knew by then that it was definitely Aaron, but she never stopped or responded to my yelling between panting breaths. We're at the edge of the park now, and I felt a moment of panic as I realized I'd lost her again. There were too many trees and obstructions there between bathrooms and benches and playground equipment, and all of it was giving extra weight and dimension to the lengthening shadows of the night. I just needed to... You need help, little lady? I let out a startled scream as I looked around to find a man staring at me. He looked to be in his early thirties. He was wearing clothes like he'd just come from a gym. He was smiling, but there was something in his eyes I didn't like. Taking a step back, I shook my head. No, I... Did you see a little girl come this way? He chuckled. Only girl I've seen is you. You don't look that young. Not too young, anyway. The man extended his hand. Name's Keith. Can I help somehow? He glanced at his hand, then looked around again. No thanks. I... I'm just babysitting this little girl, and she ran out trying to track her down. I glanced back at him. Just... If you see a little girl by herself, yell, okay? I turned away and started jogging further into the park without waiting for a response. Five minutes later, and a new level of panic started setting in. I hadn't found her again, and I realized now I'd left my phone back in the living room. I didn't want to risk leaving the park to go get it, but I was quickly running out of places to look. I was trying to justify another pass through before running to the house when I heard laughter in the distance. That was Aaron laughing. Muttering a prayer under my breath, I started running in the direction of the sound. I was toward the center of the park, somewhere around the big fountain there. I'd been by before, but maybe she'd been hiding or she'd just gotten there, but... My thoughts died as I reached the plaza and stared up at the fountain. It was a massive thing of carved stone, riddled with intricately carved animals and trees winding this way and that between three shrinking levels of elevated pools that followed down into a large ground pool where people would throw coins for wishing. And at the top level, some 30 feet in the air. Aaron sat perched on the back of a carved bear. Aaron? Stay still, honey. What are you doing up there? The little girl waved at me happily, but didn't answer. I wanted to tell her to come down, but how could I? She might break her neck, and... Anyway. How'd you get up there? 
She swung her feet like she was spurring the stone bear forward. My friend put me up here. It can climb so good. Her eyes widened excitedly. Want me to have it bring you up here too? I frowned at her, my mind racing. What was she talking about? Had there been someone in her room? Had they abducted her? Why the hell had I left my phone behind? I glanced around but didn't see anyone. Honey, who's... No, where's your friend? I, I don't see them. Did they leave? Please let them have left. I could figure out a way to get her down. Just please let them have... No, they're right there. She pointed to the bottom of the pool, which was filled with shadows, but looked empty. I don't see anything there, Aaron. She giggled again. That's okay. It sees you. It's looking right at you. I felt a chill go up my spine. She kept saying it, not he or she. It had to be some weird imaginary friend, but then how did she get all the way up there? And what if there was something in the dark that I just couldn't... Hey, so you found her. I jumped and turned to see the guy, Keith, standing a few feet away again. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did. He was staring up at Aaron now, his expression unreadable. Huh. How'd she get all the way up there? I felt my heart starting to beat faster. Had he done this somehow? I looked back up at Aaron. Honey, do you know this man? She shook her head with a frown. No? Is he your friend? Beside me, the man chuckled. <laughs> I didn't mess with your kid, honest. Just trying to be helpful. If you want me to, I'll go. I blushed and shook my head. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. I'm just... Just kind of freaked out at the moment. I need to get her down without breaking something. Keith nodded. <laughs> I see what you mean. Lots of places to slip and fall. Look, why don't you call the cops or the fire department? They can get her down, right? I felt my heart sink lower. I... I left my phone at the house. My thought occurred to me as I looked away from Aaron and back at him. Do you think you could call 911 and... He stepped closer now and his friendly expression had hardened into something hungry and cruel. I was hoping you'd say that. I took a step back, but he was quicker, reaching out and grabbing my forearm to pull me toward him even as he wrapped his other arm around me. I yelled, but then his hand was at my throat, his hot breath in my ear as he began to stagger walk me back toward the tall bushes at the edge of the fountain plaza. Keep quiet, bitch. If you give me what I want, I might not have to fuck you up too bad. I might have to pull that kid down. I shot an elbow in his stomach, and for a moment, his grip loosened, but then he was punching me in the side of the head once, twice, a third time, my vision blurring for a moment as he started dragging me again. I wanted to tell Aaron to get away, to go run or hide or get help, but it was all too late. Maybe if I just went along with him, he'd leave her alone and... A deep scream split the night air. My eyes instinctively turned toward the sound, and I managed to focus enough to see the water in the bottom of the fountain churning as something unseen pushed through it. Great splashes of water were flung out under the cobblestone of the plaza as something silently charged us, ripping the man away from me so harshly that I tumbled to the ground. Now the man was screaming, squealing shrilly as his feet danced in the air, suspended by something invisible that began to break his arms over and over like it was folding up a used drinking straw. The screams became thinner, then Keith's workout shirt ripping as something wrapped around his chest and began to squeeze. New muffled popping sounds came from his chest with each undulation of pressure. 
I stared at all this with a combination of mute horror, satisfaction, and relief, but it wasn't until it started eating him that the unreality of it all broke through my shock for me to begin crawling away in terror. Huge bloody chunks would suddenly be gone, though somehow nothing made it all the way to the ground. Whatever it was that had him, it was exceedingly efficient in having its meal, and by the time I'd crawled back to the fountain, it was as though the man had never been there at all. I looked up at Aaron, keeping my voice low. Is... Is that your friend? She looked down over the ear of the bear and nodded. Yeah, and he's your friend now too. The little girl looked past me. Hey, get me back down, please. I did what you wanted. We need to go home and finish our pizza. I felt the air shift near me as something passed by, heard the quiet slosh of the water as it went back into the fountain, and pulled Aaron from the bear. I wanted to protest, to ask it to stop, but I was terrified, and honestly, it hadn't done anything to the little girl yet, at least that I knew of. So instead, I sat shuddering as I watched her seemingly float through the air before being placed gently down at my side, and when she offered me her hand, I took it and stood up. Are you sure you're safe with it, Aaron? She nodded. Yeah, we are. It's been my friend for a long time, and it looks after me. But it gets hungry sometimes, and it's hard for me to find it something that's okay for it to eat. I swallowed. We were walking back toward the house now, and it took everything I had to not scoop her up and break into a run. The image of some invisible thing pulling me back and tearing me apart was honestly the main thing that stopped me. Eat? Like... People? Aaron shrugged. Yeah, mainly, I guess. I know that sounds mean, but it only gets bad people, I think. It was kind of young, too, when it first found me, but it's a lot bigger now. It told me it needs to have a grown-up to protect it so it can eat enough. She giggled and looked past me. <laughs> I told you you're being silly. I know you still love me, too. I'm not mad about it. I super swear. The girl rolled her eyes at me. It gets so sensitive about stuff, but I understand, and I want her to be happy. She gave my hand a squeeze. That's why I picked you. I slowed down. Picked me how? She grinned. It's going to protect you now. I don't know if you'll ever be able to see it or hear it, but it says that's okay. It'll be happy just so long as it can eat some and keep you safe. She laughed and nodded past me. And visit me sometimes, too. Blinking, I stopped in the middle of the street and stared down at her. Aaron, I don't want that. I... I mean, I guess I believe you after everything, but I don't want some invisible friend just hanging around me all the time and occasionally eating people it thinks is bad. Aaron was already shaking her head. No, it won't be like that. I mean, the hanging around part, yeah, but you can decide who it eats, so long as it gets to eat every few months. It just gets sad if it's too hungry. She shrugged again, her voice softer as her gaze drifted into the dark asphalt. Besides, being around isn't something you pick picks you. That was ten years ago. Since then, I've been pretty lucky. I have a great contract job, plenty of friends, and while back in high school and freshman year of college, I was kind of overweight and sickly, I haven't had so much as a cold in the last decade. And people are always asking me what diet or exercise routine I used to stay in such good shape. I don't tell anyone about my special friend's blessings, but I'm honest about the rest. I eat what I want, but I do run a lot. I mainly run late at night, through parks, rough neighborhoods, areas I read about in the newspaper, 
Over time, I've had to drive out farther for some of my midnight runs, but the change of scenery is actually quite nice, even if it's running past an abandoned factory or a trap house. And honestly, this whole experience has made me feel better about humans as a race. Do you know how hard it is to find someone that will attack you? It probably feels like you could turn down any dark street and find death. But really, most people don't want to do more than be left alone or, at worst, talk a little shit as you jog by. Sometimes it takes weeks just to find someone that will cross the line between douchebag and dinner. Still, I must be doing a pretty good job of keeping our friend well fed. Every time we visit Aaron, she tells me everything it's saying and about how happy it is and how much it loves us. And despite being taller than me now, when Aaron hugs it, her hands can't even reach all the way around the air she's squeezing. Funny enough, the shared bond with our guardian has also brought the two of us closer together. She's two years away from college, but she's already hinting around at going somewhere near where I move after my current work contract is done. And to be fair, I'd like her to be close too. I think we both would. That's when I look at cities for the next stage of my career. I cross-check them against several different things they have to have. Nice scenery not too far away? Check. Good college with a safe campus? Check. Selection of cool restaurants and affordable housing? Check. All that and good running paths through areas with a high instance of violence crime? Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. I liked Ben. I really did. I mean, he was a nice guy. We had some fun times together in college, messing around the dorm, going to parties, all the dumb shit that college guys do. He was cool and all, but he was a little... pretentious. Well, I guess the word he used was artistic. He thought he was real smart, spent a lot of time trying to prove it to everyone. He had his own blog developed to film critiques. Not the big ones, though. Just little indie productions because nothing else was worth his time. When he got like that, he could be pretty insufferable. Perhaps the most annoying thing he did was performance art. Now, I don't want to be the guy who says that all performance art is dumb, but... Yeah, no, all performance art is dumb. Oh look, you're on a display painting a picture of Jesus from your own urine. How original and edgy. Maybe I'm a little jaded, but it always seemed so contrived to me. Fortunately, Ben really loved it. He thought there was something beautiful in art that was physically living, and he devoted an embarrassing amount of time to it. Anyway... I hung out with Ben a few times after college, but we mostly just met up to do some heavy drinking and maybe hit a strip club or two. He considered that performance art as well, which was just fine with me. Gave me an excuse to waste some ones. Since we didn't hang out very often, I had a bad feeling when he contacted me about a month before last Halloween. He called me up at about 7 in the morning on a Saturday, which is too early to even consider waking up, in my opinion. I answered in a daze, and he started running his mouth like crazy, as though afraid that if he didn't get it all out at once, he never would. Mikey, hey, Mike, listen, buddy, I need your help, okay? Okay, okay, I've got this idea for a performance, and, well, it's gonna be killer, you know? So good. It's going down on Halloween. Can you come help? Look, I'll even pay you, man. 50 bucks. How about it? No. I've never cared much for Halloween one way or the other, and I'm a pretty easy guy. $50 to probably just sit around and run a fog machine or some bullshit? Sign me up. For the right price, I could even pretend that I wanted to be there. Besides, what else are friends for? A few days later, he gave me the details. To be honest, I was a little shocked when he sent me the email. I know that performance art is intended to be edgy and can sometimes get a little dangerous, but this seemed like downright neglect. 
thanks for agreeing to do this for me. I've talked to a few other people, but they weren't really comfortable with it for reasons you'll probably be able to figure out. Of course, I understand if you want to back out, but I think you're probably the most reliable person I know. It's really not that big of a deal, I'm sure you'll agree. As I'm sure you've noticed, vampires have become very prominent in the media as of late. I say vampires because they are beginning to deviate so wildly from the traditional myths that they resemble forest fairies more than anything else. Altruistic? Sparkly? Whiny? (laughs) Give me a break. We need more Dracula. We need more Carmilla. We need more death, destruction, and blood. My performance will center on the theme of rebirthing the vampire. For the vampire to be reborn, he must first be buried. To turn people's attention back to the myths of old, I will be doing just that. I will be burying the vampire. I have a group of viewers signed up already to participate in the performance, so you don't need to worry about that. I'm going to plant a series of vampire-themed clues around town for them to follow. The clues should be pretty simple, and it will probably take no more than an hour or an hour and a half for them to find me. Here comes the... somewhat... controversial part. Essentially, for this performance to have any semblance of meaning, I need to be buried alive. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe. I have a buddy from back home who's built me a coffin with a hole in the top. I'll be fixing it with a pipe that will stick out an inch or two above the ground. That way I won't run out of air. I also have a few necessities in the coffin in case something happens. Food, water, and a flashlight. Once they arrive at my grave, which will be completely vampirized, they will be provided with an array of shovels that will bring me back to life. A reincarnation of the true mythological history of vampires. Here's where you come in. I need you to bury me. In addition, I need you to be my safety net. If they can't find me, if something goes wrong, if I become sick, I need you to be the one to get me out or call the police, if necessary. I'll also need you to decorate my grave, make it real creepy. Don't worry, I'll send you some blueprints. I know this is a little stressful, and it may take some time for you to decide, but rest assured, this is a completely safe project. There's no danger of suffocation, and the coffin is sturdy, so it's very unlikely that I'll collapse. I really just need you there for support and the actual hard work of burying me. What do you say? I'd even be willing to pay you $100 if that's what you need. Let me know. R.I.P. Ben. I stared at my screen for a few minutes. Completely dumbfounded. Once I cut through all the bullshit about art and vampires and rebirth, what it came down to was death. This guy actually wanted me to almost kill him. I mean, sure, it probably was safe, but my mind went over the plan slowly. What if I couldn't get him out in time? One shovel and a pile of dirt wouldn't be a fast job. Furthermore, what if something happened to me? Before making a decision, I sent him another email asking if he was really sure he was up for this. Of course he knew, he said. And then he said something that would always stick with me. Art must be a little dangerous, my friend, for it to be real. A month later, I found myself standing at the foot of a grave. It was six feet deep and perfectly rectangular. Sitting at the bottom was a tapered coffin covered with black lacquer, a white skull painted on the top, and the eye of the skull was a hole just big enough for the PVC pipe. Stenciled underneath was a line from Dracula. For the dead travel fast. I stood there like an idiot, waiting for Ben to show up. In the end, I decided to go along with this stupid gig, but 
Ben was a stubborn bastard, and if I didn't help him, someone else would. At least that's my justification. But the real reason was that, deep inside my heart, his words were still echoing. Art must be a little dangerous for it to be real. I ended up doing a little more work than I had intended. For one, I had to place his stupid clues around the city. It wasn't hard work, but it took some time to get them all in the proper places. Luckily for Ben, they were pretty obvious clues. There was no need to worry that his participants would be unable to find him. Ben had set up the grave in a coffin a few days prior to Halloween. It was out in the woods, just on the outskirts of town, no chance of it being disturbed. I'd tried to talk him out of burying it the whole six feet down. Something happens and I need to get you out fast, what will I do? Can't you put it closer to the surface? Ben had just shaken his head in exasperation. You just don't get it, do you? It has to be done right. Remember what I told you. Art must be a little dangerous for it to be real. So I shrugged and let him mess around with whatever dumbassery would get him off. I was just beginning to wonder if I should have brought more beer. This promised to be a long night when Ben finally showed up. I had to restrain my laughter when I saw his get up. A cheap Dracula costume from Walmart had never looked so pathetic, especially when topped off with those cheap plastic fangs. He greased his hair back and painted on a widow's peak. I couldn't resist. <laughs> wow. Seriously, dude? He gave me a stern look. It's a comment on the commercialization of vampires and horror as we know it today. He fished around in his pocket and pulled out a walkie-talkie. Here, take one. The range isn't very far, but my phone won't work that far underground. You'll have to stay nearby. Let me know if you're going out of range. I shrugged and took it. Okay, but you brought your cell just in case, right? Now, what good will it do if it doesn't work? This guy's batshit insane, I thought. But he handed me the hundred dollars and suddenly it didn't seem to matter anymore. I held him into the coffin and shut the lid. He seemed pretty calm. If it were me, I knew I'd be having a panic attack. I fit the PVC pipe into the hole. It slid in perfectly snug. I climbed out the coffin and grabbed my shovel, taking one last look at the shiny black peeking out from the dirt. With a resigned shrug, I started to shovel in the dirt. Okay, well, he asked for this, I thought. It took almost a full hour to get the dirt piled in. PVC pipe was just barely visible over the grave. I piled the earth around it to hide it as well as I could. Then I set up the rest of the grave, a hideously gothic headstone made of styrofoam and cheap Walmart flowers. Once it was finally finished, I sat back against a tree and waited. There was an awful lot of waiting to be done. Three hours later, his participants still hadn't come. He'd buzzed in on the walkie-talkie a few times, asking me if they'd shown up. I continually answered in the negative, wondering how long he'd be willing to keep up the charade. He must be getting worried, I thought, staring at my watch. It was already 10 p.m. and not a soul to be seen. Hey, Mike, something must have happened. I, I don't think they're coming. Can you get me out of here? Ben's voice crackled and faded in and out of the static fuzz. I took another swig of my beer and heaved a sigh. Of course they weren't coming. They were frantically searching for the last clue. My hand crept into my pocket as I felt it folded there, the creases poking at the soft flesh in my palm. Mike? Are you there? Did you go out of range? I turned to walkie-talkie off. I didn't need it anymore anyway. Carefully, I picked up a handful of disturbed earth from the top of the makeshift grave. I poured it down the pipe and listened. 
I heard the muffled exclamation, the series of expletives. Then I could hear a thumping sound. Must be hitting the top of the coffin. I smiled a little to myself as I poured more dirt through the pipe. Ben's struggles got louder and louder, and I felt a certain heat rising up in me. I knew it could be good, but I didn't know it could be this good. This was incredible. This was perfect. This was godly. Eventually, I grew bored of shoving earth down into the coffin. I could hear Ben screaming and sobbing, reverberating up the pipe. I yanked a handkerchief out of my back pocket and stuffed it inside. I made sure to plug it up good and tight. It would only be a matter of time now. Assuming he could regulate his breathing, he could possibly have a few hours, but I knew he was panicking. And that would simply serve to shorten his time. Pounding grew weaker as I finished my beer. Once I was certain there was no saving him, I went to finish my work. Ben was right. Everything really did go off without a hitch. I don't know what it was I was so worried about. I'd gone to find his lost sheep, the wayward participants who were scrambling in frustration for the last clue. I scolded them for making us wait so long, acted the part of the reluctant friend indulging his lunatic companion. I took them out to the grave. It was now past midnight. They sat hushed as I gave the stupid speech that Ben had prepared for me. Everything seemed normal. I made sure to stow away the rag before anyone could see it. Friends, foes, and everyone in between, tonight we gather to resurrect the ancient horror that has plagued mankind for centuries. Its tale, once a gruesome epic of blood and seduction, has become nothing more than the commercialized fodder as society has aged. Now the time has come for the phoenix to burn and rise again. So too shall the blood-soaked visage of the vampire. My voice resonated through the woods and the morons in attendance clapped as they all reached for their shovels. We dug him up in about half an hour. It was much faster work with this host of suckers. It was good that we reached the coffin quickly because I could barely contain my excitement. Two of the men opened the coffin and screamed. The woman leaned in over the grave to peek as well, full of expectancy. There was something dreadful about the scene, to be sure. Ben's face had gone gray, sprayed over with a few specks of dirt. His hands were bloody, his fingernails pried off. Deep scratches decorated the top of the lid. The men who had opened his tomb dragged him out in a panic, unsure if this was part of the performance or not. A few moments of silence, listening at his chest produced no heartbeat. The proclamation was definitive. He was dead. They screamed. They called the police. They alternatively looked at his body and shielded themselves from his horror, enraptured yet struggling. They ignored me. But that was fine. It was fine because they were admiring my work, the work of a real artist. Finally, I had been given this opportunity to prove my worth. Finally, I had found my sacrificial lamb. And it had been a rousing success. The heat raging in my body affirmed that much. I didn't even care if I was caught, so long as I could have this moment to hold for the rest of my life. Ben was right, and I should have known. A man of principle never lies, and I owe him a debt of gratitude for realizing the artist within me. Art must be a little dangerous for it to be real. I've been having really strange dreams lately. I'm not sure if they mean anything yet, but something about them has given me an awful feeling. Almost like there's some kind of sign about something bigger than I understand at the moment. 
If anyone has had similar experiences, I'd love to hear about them. The first and most important thing to note is when I was a kid, I used to frequently have vivid nightmares. There wasn't ever any kind of overarching theme to them, so I never really made much of it other than the fact that my brain really enjoyed terrifying me in my sleep. Ultimately, I've always categorized this as a good thing because I think they've mostly helped me not be afraid of things in the real world. As I've gotten older, I've also learned to not let bad dreams linger in my mind. As macabre as it sounds, I could have a horrible dream so real after I wake up I question if it was there and still not stress about falling asleep right after. And that's partly why this time around I'm a little bit concerned. For the first time since I was a kid, I'm afraid of what I saw for reasons that I'm still trying to figure out. The dream started off with me in a pitch black room playing what I'm assuming was an N64 era game on a small television. I don't know why, but I think I was nervous about something. I remember the darkness around me felt alive, or at least something tangible that was moving around me. The light from the TV seemed to be the only place the dark refused to touch. I don't recognize the game, but I seem to be playing as a black-haired girl walking around in a forest with no apparent objective. I looked at some trees for a moment before staring up into the sky when I heard a voice. It said something along the lines of, The most terrifying part is that you'll never win. Suddenly I got this feeling of hopelessness, and I knew I needed to immediately leave the forest. Outside of the game, I could feel the darkness around me becoming more energetic. Black tendrils began to eat away at the light of the television, and my vision began to blur. The game's music started to blare at deafening levels. Still, I'm determined to do everything I can to steer my character out of the forest, but the ground began to warp under her feet. The force was so great, it shook the screen about and effectively stopped any progress I could have made to get out. And then, almost as if the darkness made its way into the game, a tree root resembling one of the tendrils shot up from underneath the ground and wrapped around the girl. And then everything went calm for a moment. From the bottom of the screen, something appeared with its back turned to me. It looked like a small sun with the texture of the moon. As it rose to the center of the screen, so did my dread. Quickly it spun around to reveal a wide, toothy smile and small eyes that seemed to mock me while boring holes into my soul. And then... I woke up. It didn't kill me, or say anything ominous, but its mere presence left me in a cold sweat, and the fear lasted for at least an hour. Despite it being almost three in the morning, I felt the need to walk around my apartment and watch some funny YouTube videos to get my mind off the dream. I kept trying to rationalize that the face itself wasn't scary, but the feeling it left me with was something I'd never experienced before. Once I'd calmed back down and laid back in bed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, so I flipped my phone and left the screen on to give me some extra light for comfort. I quickly fell asleep and landed in a dream where I was surrounded by buildings. Looking up, I saw firefighters in hazmat suits repel down from the sky. They pushed past me and began rushing into the buildings. Confused, I tried to follow them, but I was swiftly knocked back by a wall of flame. I looked around again to see all the buildings were on fire, and there was the undeniable smell of human flesh. My eyes scanned the area for a way out when I caught a glimpse of the moon and saw that wicked face smiling down on me, and suddenly I was shocked back awake. I didn't sleep again that night. I was banking on the memory of that face fading, but I could see it crystal clear in my head. I told people about my dream, and many of them told me not to worry about it, but I don't know. I did, and I am. No matter how I tried to rationalize things, deep down, I knew my fear was justified. As I went about my day, I had this strange compulsion to recreate what I saw. 
I'm not proud to say that I did this. I'm not entirely sure why, but I managed to digitally recreate the face as a 2D image, and I was looking for ways to turn it into a 3D model. It was weird. It was almost like I had an obsession with making sure that this thing made it into the real world and that other person could look at it. This analogy seemed pretty appropriate, given the time, but that's how a virus spreads, right? Take over the host and then make the host spread you around to repeat the process. But if it's some kind of virus, then what's the source? I don't remember seeing that face anywhere before I dreamt of it. I think of the one conversation in particular that stuck out to me after I made the image that was one of the friends who recognized the face. She couldn't pinpoint from where, but she swore she'd seen it, staring down at her as she tried to sleep one night. It's one of the few leads I have on this thing, so maybe it's worth investigating. I'm not really sure that I should try to get any more involved than I am right now, but I have so many questions. If it really isn't just me, then where the fuck is this thing coming from? As you're reading this, I can imagine that many of you don't see the urgency that I seem to be addressing the situation with. It's just a bad dream, who cares? And if I was in your shoes, I think I'd say the same thing. People have bad dreams all the time, especially someone who literally said they happened to all the time as a kid. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm freaking out too much over what could just be a feeling. But the past week, I've continued to have horrible nightmares, and the worst thing about them is that I'm starting to feel pain in my dreams. A couple of times, I've even woken up with bruises where I was hurt. Every shitty thing that's happened in my head has affected my senses as if they were absolutely real. I've broken bones, seen people I love die, heard the wails of screaming children, and smelled death countless times. The worst of it was a dream I simply couldn't wake from. It felt like I was trapped for days in a post-apocalyptic city. All I could do was wander and look upon the sheer chaos that had befallen whatever poor people lived there. I know my sense of reality was warped, as the barrier between the real world and the dream world seemed to basically be non-existent, but I knew for a fact I was dreaming. Because of this, I thought maybe I could attempt to change the outcome. But I was as powerless in there as I am out here. It's odd feeling bad for people that aren't real. But still. As I walked through the near-empty cities, seeing bodies in various states of decay and others very nearly on the brink of death, begging for their lives, you can't help but feel for them. The sky never changed either. It stayed a morose gray, and it felt like every foot I walked snapped just a bit more of my hope. Never enough to make me give up entirely, but just enough to leave me thinking that I could go home just so that hope could be crushed over and over again. I eventually found the forest that I'd seen in my initial dream, but I absolutely refused to step foot in it. I turned around to find literally anywhere else to go, but saw absolutely nothing. My two options were to fall in the vastness of empty space, or go to the place where I'd seen that thing and face whatever consequences lay there. Either way, I couldn't win. When I stayed awake, I was stressed and feared to sleep. And when I went to sleep, hell awaited me. It was only then that the only sensible option was to give up in my moment of absolute realization. The last bit of hope died in me that day. I simply laid down, curled up, and waited. I woke up in my bed and cried. Make of that what you will, but I still think about that specific dream pretty often. As you might guess, the one connecting theme between these dreams was that I saw that damn face in near every one of them. Sometimes not for more than a moment, but it was always there, always watching, always enjoying my suffering. 
It never spoke to me, but I did hear that voice again after one of my dreams, and it said a very familiar line. You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? I'm still putting the puzzle pieces together, but I know that comes from the Majora's Mask game. Popularized, of course, by that Ben Drowned story. Maybe this was related to it in some way. Then again, I could have just said that to fuck with me and throw me off. Either way, it's all I've got so far. I need to figure out what's going on, but I'm afraid I'll just end up hurt. Then again, it's not like I can go through this much longer. I've always had this idea that dreams are really alternate realities that you experience while you sleep. Is it possible that this thing is making me experience these other horrible real variations of myself? That would explain some of the bruising when I've been injured, but if that's true, is it possible to get stuck in one of those worlds? And then what happens to you here? Could it be from one of those worlds? Maybe that's why I was so afraid of the first dream. Perhaps that version of me knew what that face represented. It scares me how little I know. Something kind of interesting happened when I went on a walk to try and clear my head. A homeless man called me over with a sign that read, Change for Wisdom. After giving him five dollars, he gave me some line about some disease and how I was sick. He claimed that he could smell darkness on me and to not ignore the visions because they're tangible. Whatever that means. He talked about how a guy not from here had seen an evil face. During his dream, he ended up killing someone. Turns out, an actual body was found, and the person who actually committed the murder claimed to have no memory of doing so. Like I said, more puzzle pieces. So far, they lead me to believe that the fact in my dreams are more part of the waking world than I think, which means I need to be extra careful. Then again, it could just as easily be some kind of malevolent force in the real world that's making me see these awful things. If anything happens, I'll keep everyone updated, but now I'll leave you with an image of the face attached at the bottom of this post. And if anyone recognizes it as a face they've seen in their dreams, I'm so sorry. Jackie was a werewolf. Pete was a vampire, though he kept referring to himself as a Dracula, just to piss me off. And I was a witch, though admittedly the outfit was just a half-assed modification from my initial idea of girl Gandalf after my older brother Kevin set fire to my beard the week before. We were too old for trick-or-treating, or as Pete liked to call it, trick-or-treating. And we knew it, but that was part of the point. After a five-year hiatus on free candy because Halloween was for babies, we'd come back around to the idea that so long as we leaned into it being a prank or a game or a social experiment instead of just teenagers begging for candy that we could just drive to the store and buy, it was cool again. The idea was this. We would drive up to every house, not hiding the fact that we were old enough to do so. Pete and I were seniors, Jackie was home for her first year of college, and between his beard, her tits, and my height, no one was mistaking any of us for children. That being said, we had a rule that we had to dress up in legit costumes and couldn't act weird or assholey when we went up to get the candy. Just polite trick-or-treating as to do anything else could affect the bet. Because this is where the game part came in. Before we got out of the car at each house, we would each bet whether that house would give us candy or not. The odds were always in favor of yes, most people might get irritated at older teenagers coming for candy, but so long as we were polite about it, it was hard for them to pass their default position of honoring Halloween customs. So the scoring worked like this. If you bet a house would give us candy, you got one point. If you bet that a house wouldn't give us candy and you were wrong, you lost one point. But if you bet a house wouldn't give candy and you were right, that was worth five points. 
so long as you didn't do anything overtly rude or whatever to make sure things went your way. Sarcastic tone of voice was okay, so were fake accents, but you couldn't say or do anything that was really impolite or highlighted our age beyond our obvious appearance and ability to drive up in the first place. No, thanks dude, gotta get back to the wife and kids now, or that kind of thing. In other words, reasonable lying was fine, so long as it was done courteously. We were done for the night. Whoever had the most points got to divide up all the candy. The best of all, they got to pick the first three things the other two ate. Didn't matter how gross or sketchy, they had to eat it if someone gave it to one of us during the night. Had to have steaks, after all. So far, Pete was somehow ahead. He was a good guesser. He always had been, and it was irritating. I was only two points behind, but it felt like we were running out of houses as we moved further and further out of the dark countryside. That had been part of our plan. Go out to the places that had lights on, but were more remote, as they'd be less likely to have many trick-or-treaters. They'd also be less likely to have candy at all, but most of the houses with decorations and lights on gave up something, even if it was from their own private stash. Jackie was one point behind me, though I still thought her strategy for the evening was dumb. She was voting no candy on every house based on the idea that the five points when she was right would override the one point losses for the rest of the time. I tried to point out that we were only stopping in houses that looked like decent candidates to begin with, and that always voting the same wasn't really playing the game, but she wouldn't budge. And I hated to admit it, but her strategy really hadn't sucked so far, and one no-candy house would put her back in the lead. That's why I complained when she started turning onto the long driveway at the end of Court 13. She snickered as she completed the turn and gave me a grin, her fur-covered face green and sinister in the meager light from the dashboard. It has jack-o'-lanterns out at the fence gate with burning candles in them. That counts as decorations and lights. Pete gave a groan. <sighs> Fuck. Winnie, she's right. Jackie had started down a driveway that was paved, but with thick hardwoods on both sides that obscured the way forward as the path curved to the right. Irritated, I shook my head. It's supposed to be decorations on the house, not a mile away at the road. This doesn't count. Jackie shrugged. Well, we'll see then. If the house is dark or has no decorations, then we'll turn around and leave. I'm not trying to cheat, but I'm not turning down a good prospect either. Sighing, I slumped back in my seat. <sighs> Fine, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's not even a house back... Holy shit. That last had been from Pete, and I didn't have to ask what he meant. We'd just rounded the last corner, and instead of more woods or just an empty, overgrown field, there was a large antebellum mansion with brick walls of dark gray and tall white columns that lined the front like long teeth. We saw most of this from the sweeping light of Jackie's headlights, but they weren't the only things lighting up the night. Behind the hulking shadow of the house, I could make out the shifting orange glow of a fire, and up on the porch there were four more jack-o'-lanterns to match the ones out on the road. Jackie turned and gave me a satisfied smile as she pointed first to the glow of the firelight behind the house. The lights, and then the pumpkins on the porch, and decorations. I sniffed. I mean, technically, yeah, but does this place look like somewhere we want stuff from? It's dark and creepy. They probably have a bucket of razor blade candy in there. Pete laughed. It's Halloween. This is the kind of house we should be visiting. And isn't the razor blade thing more of an urban legend? Jackie shook her head. No, that happened to my cousin once. But it's okay, because I confidently bet we will get no candy here. I rolled my eyes. What a shocker. Bold strategy there. She squinted at me. If you're scared, just say you're scared. I floated my middle finger around in front of her as I did a wavering ghost voice. Fuck you. 
Just don't come crying to me when I give you a poison candy bar covered in rat turds to eat. Snorting, Jackie turned off the car and got out. Come on, sore losers. It's Jackie's time to shine. I bet no candy, too. I couldn't see her face as we approached the house, but I could still hear Jackie smirking. Decided to back a winner, huh? Smart play. Won't help you in the end, but I respect you for acknowledging my awesomeness. <sighs> Whatever. Pete, what's your bet? Mm, candy. These people have to be loaded, right? If they're even... The porch light came on as we started at the steps. Home. And then under my breath. Fuck. Pete was already on the porch, grinning back down at us. Always bet on the Dracula. Turning, he walked over and rang the ornate doorbell next to the equally intricate carved black door. Far away, we heard a small bell chime. This was a weird house. Everything about this felt weird. Why couldn't they see that? I was about to suggest we just give up the game and declare Pete the winner when the door's lock clicked and it swung open. On the other side, a dead woman stood smiling at us. Pete must have been right. Whoever these people were, they had to be kind of loaded because her costume was movie quality. Not because it was over the top or really elaborate, but because it was so subtle. The blue dress she wore was faded and curled at the edges with what could have been age or rot, and her skin had a faint blue tinge that stood out in the porch's overhead light, but wasn't cartoonish or overdone. The only other sign that she wasn't just an attractive middle-aged soccer mom was her left ear. Her long, dull brown hair was artfully pulled over her ear on that side, revealing a gnawed stub instead of whole flesh. Damn, you look awesome. Pete was right, though it was hard to tell from his lingering gaze on her breasts if he was talking more about her zombie outfit or her generally being kind of hot. Jackie apparently thought it was the latter as she nudged him in the ribs and stepped forward, holding out her briefcase. Trick or treat! A woo! I stifled a sudden, nervous laugh. The briefcase thing. Jackie had brought a briefcase instead of a normal trick or treat bag. At first, me and Pete hadn't understood why, but once we saw how she was betting against candy every time, it made more sense. She thought that using something that wasn't Halloween-y or immature would tilt the scales toward pissing someone off so they didn't give us anything. I couldn't say for sure it had worked, but at the two houses that had told us we were too old, they both looked at that damn thing. Still, it didn't seem to matter to this lady. She just gave us a soft laugh as she looked at us each in turn. Well, well. I appreciate the compliment, and I accept the commencement of bargaining as well. Still chuckling, she took a step back. <laughs> I have all manner of treats in the kitchen and will brook no tricks on this holy night. All I ask is that you tell me what you are before you pass my door. She gestured back down the hallway to a kitchen that was dancing with yellow candlelight. I shot Pete a concerned look. Ma'am, we don't normally go into people's houses. She nodded. I understand, but I just finished cooking and I'm afraid I have too large a variety to bring out here. Shrugging, she started to close the door. But if you refuse the offered treats, we can close the... Pete stepped forward. No! No, ma'am. We're happy to come in. He glared at me. Forgive my friend. She's a sore loser. The woman smiled wily at him as she moved the hair behind her other perfect ear. So glad to hear it. Her face suddenly became more serious. Now, what are you? Pete hesitated for a moment and then bared his plastic fangs. To be fair, they were expensive and looked good other than being a different shade than his actual teeth. I, madam, am a Dracula. I expected the woman to laugh or look angry, but instead she just nodded. Very well. 
You may enter our home. Pete stepped in as she turned like a jockey. And what are you? Jackie had lowered her briefcase again, and even through the tufts of fake brown hair glued to her cheeks and forehead, I could tell that she was worried too. Still, she wouldn't quit playing so long as one of us kept going either. So giving another small howl, she stepped closer to the door. I'm a werewolf, ma'am. Very well. You may enter our home. The woman looked at me. And you? I started to speak, but something held me back. This... this woman wasn't right. I couldn't say what the problem was with her, and I didn't know enough to make the others leave, but there was a weight to everything the woman was saying and doing. As though this wasn't some kind of campy Halloween roleplay, but part of something real. Serious. And she was still staring expectantly at me. Hard hammering, I stepped forward. I, uh... I'm a girl dressed up as a witch. <laughs> I was supposed to be female Gandalf, but my jerk brother burned my beard. The woman studied me for several moments before smiling again. Very well. You may enter our home. Closing the door behind me, the woman led us back to the kitchen. It was massive. Double ovens, eight burners set into a large wooden island, and a long table along one end filled with a variety of cookies and candies and muffins and cakes, along with candied apples and pumpkin tarts and other dishes I didn't recognize. Holy shit. I, I, I mean, dang. We've got quite the spread here. The woman chuckled. <laughs> Thank you. We don't give any visitors out here. My boys have finicky diets, so I always wind up overdoing it. But it is Halloween, after all. Please, take what you like. I felt a stab of panic and leaned into Jackie's ear. None of this stuff is wrapped up. It could have anything in it. We can't eat this stuff. Pulling back, she gave me a frown. How's that different than anything else? You think someone can't rewrap candy or inject something through a wrapper? And how often do you try fancy stuff like this? Pete leaned into the conversation. I don't think I noticed your whole I'm a girl dressed like a witch thing. You've lost. Give it up. Don't fuck up the best meal I've had in like ever. He grinned at her host. So, how much is it okay for us to take? It all looks so good. She beamed at him. As much as you want, of course. There are plates and bowls at the end, so feel free to sample there, and I can make you bags to take with you as well. As I said, I have far too much. The woman frowned as Pete reached towards some kind of potato fritter piled on a platter near the table's edge. Oh, no. Not that for you, though. Pete pulled his hand back and looked at her questioningly. Oh. Sorry. She waved her hand. Not at all. It's just that I prepare these with garlic, and I wouldn't want you to get sick. Pete stared at her blankly for a moment, and then let out a loud laugh. Oh, shit, right. Yeah, I guess I have a selective diet. He picked up a small crystal glass containing what looked like dark layers topped with whipped cream. Is this okay for me, you think? The woman nodded. Yes, of course. Blood mousse with bits of caramelized baby fat for texture. She picked one up and handed it to Jackie. This should be good for you as well. Glancing between us, Jackie picked up a spoon. Sure, thanks. It looks delicious. The woman turned and patted my arm. All the food on the left side of the table is meat-free, my dear. I gave a slow nod. Well, I'm not a vegetarian, but the cookies and muffins look great. I pointed toward Pete as he was eating the first bite of his mousse. But those don't really have some kind of meat, and Pat spat a dark wad onto the floor as it began to retch. Lady, what the fuck is in that? 
When he looked up, he didn't look at her but me, his eyes watery and fearful. She frowned. Just as I've said, congealed blood. Quite a favorite of your kind. He was hardly listening, hawking and spitting as he tried to get the taste out of his mouth without trusting any of the various drinks on offer as a way to clean his palate. On his fourth spit, one of his fangs flew out and landed in the middle of a plate filled with bat sugar cookies. What's that? The woman's tone was icy. Look at me. Show me your mouth. Pete stared at her slack jaw, his lone fang still dangling there. The fuck are you talking about? The woman's expression darkened as she turned to Jackie, who'd set her own moose back down. And what about you? The treat not to your liking? Ma'am, this, this isn't funny. We're just gonna go... I let go! Our host had grabbed Jackie's arm, gripping it hard as she pulled her closer. You answer me now. Are you truly a werewolf? Stepping forward, I tried to shove her away from Jackie, but she didn't budge or even look my way as she held my friend tight. Jackie was crying a little now. She shook her head. Of course not. It's a fucking costume. It's not even a good one. And werewolves aren't real, you crazy bitch. Let me go. The woman did as she was asked, after a fashion, slinging Jackie in Pete's direction and sending them both careening into the nearby wall before tumbling to the floor. I moved to help them, but then the woman was in my path. And you, are you a girl dressed as a witch? I could barely breathe as I squeaked out my words. Why? Why are you doing this? Answer me. Now. Yes, yes, I, I, I'm a girl just as a witch. She nodded, giving me a satisfied smile. Very well. You have maintained the covenant that your companions have broken. You may pick any treats you like from the banquet table. We just... We just want to go. Go? They can't go. They've broken the covenant... And on a holy night, no less. There would be no falsehoods in this house or in my family's bargaining. Her eyes went to Jackie and Pete, even as shadowy figures began to approach between the flickers of candlelight. One looked like a dragon, another a twisted skeleton, while the third was a ropey mass thick with clawed tentacles. The woman looked at them lovingly before giving me a warm glance. My boys. The glow behind the house had been a large autumn bonfire, stacked high with wood and mounds of colored leaves that somehow never fully burned. More long timbers of wood lay to one side, and it was to two of these that the monsters bound Pete and Jackie as they thrashed it and screamed. I think I could have left before them, but I couldn't abandon my friends, even if the woman wouldn't let me intervene to save them. I did try once. And after that, her firm but gentle grip bore down on me heavily enough that I knew there was little I could do but shake and cry and tell them I was sorry. This seemed to trouble the woman somewhat. As her monstrous offspring finished lashing my friends down, she spoke to me again. I hope this doesn't seem cruel to you. My family's passed through the Imago some time ago, but we're still very old-fashioned. We keep to the ways of bargain and palaver, and we especially revere Halloween, as it's one of the few times the world drops some sort of its pretenses. I had no idea what she was talking about, but maybe if I talked to her, I could convince her to let us all go. Pretenses? She nodded. That the world is safe. The monsters aren't real, and that the truth that lay in the dark can't hurt you. Despite my plan to calm down, I could hear the angry panic in my voice. We were just wearing fucking costumes. That's what Halloween is about. Why are you punishing us for it? She frowned. Not you, just them. You were honest, and lying is certainly not what Halloween is about. 
That's just what fearful people have told themselves and taught their children. Another lie. Her lip curled, the gums around her teeth dark and withered in the bonfire's light. And we always burn liars here. I turned as I heard a fresh set of screams. The horrors at the bonfire had picked up the timbers Pete and Jackie were tied to effortlessly, swinging them up and into the dark October sky before pitching them down into the roaring heat of the flames. I let out one last scream, letting my painful cry feel the void left by the fading of their dying breaths. I squeezed tight, I slumped to the ground, wanting darkness to take me, begging to wake up and realize this was all some terrible nightmare. I felt something shift, both in my head and in the world around me, and when I opened my eyes, the night had turned to day. The remnants of the bonfire were still there, but no sign of any bones or bodies. And when I turned around, I saw the house was gone as well. Instead, it was just a large clearing, empty except for the large pile of smoldering wood, and next to me, a large pumpkin jack-o'-lantern painted black and made of some kind of red-fired earth. Choking back a fresh sob, I reached over and pulled off the stem lid and looked down inside. It was halfway filled with candy corn and chocolates, and resting on top of the sweets was a small note on orange paper. Pulling it out, I read what was written there. Don't forget your treats. Happy Halloween.